Tantor Audio, a division of recorded books, presents Empires and Kings by A.C. Bexter. Narrated by Iggy Toma and Lydia Dornay. Prologue Vled My hand trembles with relentless fury as I dangle the heavy black whip laced with fresh blood closely at my side. My chest and back burn with exhaustion aching after hours of inflicting pain against my target. Enzin Kosliev. The man tied up before me, a traitor to his own kind, hangs motionless by the thick ropes binding him to an old and splintered wooden cross. The turncoat's feet dangle helplessly beneath him. The tips of his toes sway through the pools of his own spilled blood in accord with each strike of torture I inflict. Rarely do I take it upon myself to dole out such physical punishment, but tonight an unbridled desire led me to it. The weight of responsibility I've endured over the course of the past year has come to surface and to an irrefutable degree. This traitor has merely given me reason to purge my self-harbored frustration. The offender in question was once acclaimed to be a sharp, loyal soldier. The captain in charge of Enzin's block often praised the soldier's lavish thirst for combat. Throughout his eleven years within my organization, Kosliev has dutifully done all he was ever asked and to exact specifications. To speak of his commitment to this family, after only eighteen months within his position he was promoted. Nonetheless, it was I who ordered his advancement. The abhorrent shock in finding out this man is a conspirator, collaborating against the Brotherhood itself, came with several cardinal questions. If these questions are to go unanswered, the person's name who baited Enzin to turn against his own not seized. Everything my men have worked to procure by way of territory and business thus far stands for nothing. You were planning to take over one of my stables, Enzin, I seethe, raising the whip before slicing another mark into the flesh of my detainee's chest. His jaw tenses and his head rears back as the pain inevitably echoes throughout his body. A stable you had no right to take, I add, at the same time delivering another strike in quick succession to the one before. Obediently, acting as ever the dedicated soldier to his king, the wounded man lifts his head to mine. There I meet his eyes in challenge. The depth of Enzin's contemplation is dark, hazing with loss and lurching in agonizing pain. Within the resolve of his eyes I sense the traitor has finally come to terms, recognizing he's soon to take his final breath. I did as I was told, the duplicitous man aims to convince as sweat and tears run in tandem down his face, dropping to rest on the edge of his chin. I didn't know he was planning. My grim leer quickly settles, wordlessly advising him to use careful caution before excusing himself further. His reason trails to a fragile mumble as he bows his head to wait. Part of me believes my once faithful brother is silently praying for my mercy to spare his life. The other part surmises he's praying for my mercy to end it. In no way would this captive implore my forgiveness. Not now. The willful and resilient never do. Negotiating for pardon after being found guilty would only prove he's weak. And still he'd die, no matter how, coward, criminal, or traitor. Tell me, Enzin, who coerced you to consider an act of treason against your own? I press, reining in my temper so he can clearly comprehend my question. Still so slow and with attentive calmness, I inform, the mercy you'll beg me for is contingent upon your answer. When no response is offered, I place the battered whip on top of a cool metal table, freeing my grasp for the next implement in torture. 
Fair to say that Enzin's already been worked over. The traitor had already come to recognize that his last breath was to be taken inside this dark, damp, and death-impending shed. With only one chained light hanging from the ceiling, giving him a glimpse of the darkness that would soon consume his soul, I'd been told that Enzin didn't fight. He didn't speak. He looked around the room, taking in the walls decorated with blades, chains, and metal. He was resigned to die, and had already come to peace with death. Enzin must have realized my men had been prepared for this. Before I arrived, Enzin's fingernails had already been removed, several of his toes had been broken, and his nose, now three times its natural size, had been bleeding profusely. My advisor and closest confidant, Abram Willis, had studiously listened to my order to have my men wound but not kill the outed traitor. As always, Abram followed the directive through with precise measure. Do you have any last words? I inquire, half hoping the person's name I desire so badly falls from Enzin's lips. The other half wishes for him to remain quiet so that he dies a loyal man, even if his loyalty lies to a traitor much like himself. Tell my family I love them. Enzin voices the requests with sadness while eyeing the black rod warming at my feet. Tell them I chose my family first, he begs. Family first. In terms of this organization, family is the Brotherhood, the sanction to which all soldiers pledge their lives to protect. Family is not the women in their beds nor the children in their yards. Family is our organization. You love them, I question. Yes, he gasps. You sealed their fate by doing what you've done, Enzim. No, he denies, understanding my intent. He should understand, being that he's witnessed this before. I'm going to sell them to pay off what your betrayal cost me. You don't love them at all. A guttural wave of anguish spews from Enzin's throat. More aimless tears stain his cheeks. The once dormant cords of his neck grotesquely bulge in protest. His chest, openly bleeding from hours of endured torture, strains with the power he uses against the ropes in hopes to gain his freedom from its tethering binds. As I bend to grab the branding iron carrying the letter Z at its end, I consider the irony that not only am I ready to end my first life, but that the life I'm about to take belongs to one of my own. Sullen with diminutive doubt, I press forward, gripping the black rod tightly. Often this implement is used to mark a man, no matter if he's left dead or alive. Liars, cheaters, thieves, and traitors are given the same recognizable brand. If they're left to live, they'll remember what they've done to earn the scar to their stomach. If they're dead, those who find and bury them will know as well. Once upright, I cast a confident glimpse to Abram. I find my dark-haired, broad-shouldered, confident advisor standing behind me as he always does, with loyalty, understanding, and certainty. Abram curtly nods, wordlessly assuring this is what has to happen. An important message must be sent to others. A terrifying lore must be decreed a critical warning sent for all to receive. There is no proxy and punishment for those who deceive, no forgiveness offered to those who fall prey to their own weakness, and no loyalty ties resilient enough to exonerate such premeditated betrayal. The true family, our organization, must always come first. Daddy? A small voice penetrates the room, 
pulling me from carrying out my planned revenge. When I turn in place, I survey a small child, who must be all of five years old, standing in the doorway. Her fingers are clutching the silver handle, and her small body remains stoic and unmoving. A little girl. A forsaken casualty will be left to suffer in a war between this city's mobbed families. A slight green-eyed child standing alone, yet seemingly unafraid, thick among monsters masking themselves as men, with her bare feet hitting the soiled floor one after another. She races faster and faster to get closer. In an unyielding attempt to save her father, she cries in shrieks of terror, piercing every ear she passes. Daddy! Daddy, no! As she starts to race by me on her way to him, I drop the branding iron and quickly bend to wrap my arm around her small waist. She weighs but nothing and even with no hope of escaping, her body continues its fight to be free. Finish this, I order Abram, at the same time fighting against her desperation in order to hold her closely to my side. Her kicking and screaming continues, unleashing her fears the only way a little girl of her age knows how. Please, she begs, sobbing and using her fingernails to shred my skin. Her small hands push against my arm as her legs thrash against my thigh. Daddy! She cries again. Enzin's moan of anguish mixes incoherently with his insincere vow of proclaimed love for this child. A part of the same family he proclaimed to love. The moment I turn my back on what I've started, life as I thought I knew it flashes before my eyes caging my mind with doubt and sinking my chest with regret. The stench of impending death bathes me as I take one step out of the room with her in my arms. A glimpse of life untouched by death embarks as she finally succumbs to settle in my hold, seemingly giving up hope of ever seeing her father again. When another of her harrowing sobs releases against my shoulder, Everything I ever thought I believed comes to revelation. With her body trembling in its discerned grief, my strong mind and solemn spirit give way. As her voice breaks, calling for him once more, my urge to take a man's life swiftly fades. I begin to doubt my life's position and its purpose. Thoughts of triumph and success no longer seem vital. For once, my heart breaks for what another will inevitably lose. And as the beautiful girl with snowy white hair and impenetrable green eyes utters my name in a way I've never heard it said before, a darkened sense of uncertainty voices its penance. In the chaotic shadows of my conscience, the voice tells me this girl will serve as a knot which ties me to a future I'll one day come to regret. 1. Fifteen years later. Vlad. Why are you in such a mood? My sister, Faina, morosely questions, sitting in the black leather chair directly across from mine. My office, which my sister insisted be adorned with deep red walls and coal-black trim, is located on the main floor of our family's home. Most times, if I'm not out visiting one of our stables, I can be found in here. The oversized black sofa, which sits along the farthest wall, has doubled as a bed on many occasions. With a smug grin, Baina accuses, Did you and that little whore have a tiff? Don't start with this again, I warn. Katrina has nothing to do with my mood. Her eyebrows lift and she smirks. Probably not, considering what I heard coming from your room last night. I'm your sister. I shouldn't have to remind you that. Enough, I snap. Arguing further, Faina presses. I don't like her, Vlad. 
that a woman has always been trouble. The her my sister refers to is Katrina Marx, the young woman I hired three years ago to run my most profitable stables, Rochercy. The location is kept hidden from civilians, run mainly by the women who live there and the men who operate it. Katrina takes care of the girls' personal needs, training and readying them for their many important appointments with the nameless faces they're paid to pleasure. As a reward, Katrina takes a healthy cut from their work, as well as a hefty salary paid to her by my family. Katrina doesn't know her place, Faina spits. Because you let her in your bed, she believes she has a place inside our family when she absolutely does not. My sister's observations aren't far from the truth. However, I don't care to justify what I do or don't do, nor who I choose to do it with. Whether Faina concedes or not, Katrina Marx is a smart, attractive, and talented woman. Smart in business, attractive in the way only an experienced woman can be, and talented with the assets God saw fit to gift her. She's tall, with dark eyes, dark hair, bronzed skin, and possesses incredible confidence. Katrina is no more than a business manager and a woman I occasionally fuck, Faina. Not that my sex life is any of your business. Her nose scrunches in disgust. No, your sex life isn't, but your health is. You should get checked. Katrina's been used a lot. God, my sister. Katrina is the one woman's body that I've allowed myself to use in order to relieve my sexual frustrations. In doing so, no promises between us are ever pledged. No amount of intimacy is ever expressed. Passion and desire fall prey only to carnal necessity. Quickly tiring of this topic, I ask, What is it you need from me, little sister? You've hardly left your study in three days, she rightly accuses. When you have... Mock and the others tell me you have been impossible to talk to. Masking disinterest in an attempt to ignore her, I continue looking down, studying a colored map lined with all its territories while considering my next move. And I do all this while wishing I could ask my father for guidance. I've been given fair warning that the, for lack of a better term, Sicilian Empire that dwells north of Chicago has planned once again to move in an attempt to overthrow one of our family's most profitable stables of women, located on the outskirts of what's considered their territory. And from what I've heard, these plans are expected to take flight soon. The last time Ciro Pileschi issued this same order, I instructed my men to trek across the city, to locate every drug-infested hole he had stocked and burning each one of them to the ground. By the time my men were finished, over sixty buildings had been demolished. The mission was merciless and therefore bloody. Men, both his and my own, were killed. Women working in those filthy drug lots were left as unfortunate casualties as well. The number of dollars in damages I caused the Pileshi name wasn't my intended purpose. My aim was to force Pileshi to not only recognize that I had found the traitor he placed within my midst, but for him to remember what would happen if he ever conspired against my family again. I have work to do, Faina, important work. Tell me why you insist on bothering me as I do it. My younger sister, my only sibling, has always had a knack for demanding more than I've been willing to give her, whether that be detailed information about the family operation, material items of luxury, but more than anything, the freedom to live her life as she pleases. Away from here, away from the organization, away from this part of me. Faina holds dear to a romantic heart. Therefore, 
She believes in love. The notion that self is an indulgence she's allowed as she's the mere princess to this Russian reign. Her only duty to the organization is to find a man of Russian uniform, one she can tolerate and then breed an alternate heir, one to come after any of mine in right if needed. When the time comes for me to step down, and if my son isn't ready or he's unable to take over, she's to proudly stand at her husband's side. The lid and pressure will fall on whomever she chooses to then rule this charter as their own. However, the problem remains that my stubborn little sister has refused each man I've so far deemed worthy. Faina Zaleski is witty, wily, and sharp. Her character is made up of an impenetrable mix of minx and mischief, with which very few men can contend. Each of those I've tried to sway her to consider, she spat out. She sent them back with their shattered heart in their hand and their egos unrecognizably ruined. Of course, I could order her to the obligation, forcing her to wed before she's truly ready. However, my love for Faina prevails. I want her to live a happy life. Your solemn mood is about the father, isn't it? He's upset you again, she guesses. No, I return. Though it's a blatant lie, I'm sure she'll see through. Tell me, what's he done this time? My father, who runs an entirely different, more lucrative and dangerous side of the business from Russia, honored me with this position. Being only thirty-five years old, I'm the youngest Zaleski to have been given an operation of his own. I'm charged to handle one of our family's smaller units, made up of only thirty men, give or take. Law enforcement in this city is paid an obscene amount in monthly bribes to turn a blind eye to our activities. Not often is it that we run into snags in this unacknowledged agreement. When we do... We negotiate a higher price for cooperation, and then move forward with our business. Prior to being gifted this assignment, I spent countless hours learning from books, listening to lectures, and witnessing firsthand the art of this craft. All that time I spent not only voicing my desire to be part of this brotherhood, but demonstrating my worth inside of it as well. Finally. After several years, I was left alone, without my father's protective surveillance. My only intention was, and still is, to keep his trust in my abilities. Weeks ago, when he dropped word that he'd be making more frequent visits to Chicago, I knew it was to ensure I was doing all I'd been expected. The notion he still may not believe I'm fully capable of doing as he's instructed doesn't sit well. Surely my father, the great Vori Zaleski, can appreciate all I've so far been able to procure. I've done all of this with the help of Abram, my oldest, closest friend and adviser, of course. Faina, not deterred by my lack of response, pushes. You should take a few days away from here. Go to your cabin, drink your expensive liquor, relax and unwind. The quiet and peace might do you good. Faina, I shake my head. Not all of us can pick up and disappear for weeks on end as you do. Mock is beside herself, Vlad, she notes. She knows how hard you work and... Aiming my eyes over my reading glasses, I send my sister a glare of denial. I've never been one for words, nor have I ever been one who felt compelled to explain myself. I've lived stringently by the codes of this family, and breathe each breath to serve its purpose. Aside from this, nothing else matters, including Faina and our house charge mocks little thought-out opinions. No, Faina. You and Mock will stop this incessant mothering, I tersely return. Not that either of you believe this, but I can take care of myself. 
A small smile tugs at her lips. You can. Leaning forward and placing her elbows on my desk, I brace for her never-ending mockery. You need a woman, big brother, and not a whore. You need someone who can help you take your mind off your work, not some cheap hooker who works inside of it. I don't need anyone or anything, I deny. Changing the subject, I ask, do you know where my son is? I looked for him this morning but never found him. I know where Vinyamin is, she replies with petulance. I usually do. Another demand given by my father was that as soon as I settled in this country I was to have a son. The order wasn't issued so that I fell in love, married, and lived happily ever after while creating and then tending to a family of my own. Easy and free lives don't exist for men like me, nor does it for the women we marry. The order was served for anything but the domestic purpose. He's with his tutor, Faina tells me, then elaborates. Miss Clarice is working with Venny on the supplemental math lessons I scheduled for him this week. By all accounts, Vinyamin Zaleski is a legitimate child. Yet he was birthed from the womb of a whore I slept with time and time again, until it was confirmed she carried him. After he was born, I saw no further reason to extend his mother's menial existence. To avoid her influence in our lives, I had her sold to the highest bidder at an underground flesh auction in Dallas. Recently, I'd heard she passed away due to an overdose. The drugs had been furnished by her pimp. To this day, I harbor no remorse over my decision. I have a son who serves as my determined purpose in life and a reason to honor all I've been given to live it. And the girl, I ask. I haven't seen her lurking around here for some time now, I comment sarcastically. Faina's back straightens, her shoulders tensing in agitation. Clara's been busy helping me, but you already know this. Sitting back, I remove my glasses, push away the papers I'd been holding, and release an irritated sigh. Isn't it about time for your guest to leave? I think she's old enough by now to find a life away from here. The term guest isn't entirely true. However, it's been easier for me to refer to the girl as this rather than the product of my memory's torment, the bane of my existence over the last fifteen years. She's twenty years old, but you know that too, Faina clips. And even though you call her my guest, I've never thought of her as one. To be honest, I'm surprised you've noticed she's grown up. I have, unfortunately, noticed. Clara is incredibly bright and even more beautiful, my sister continues, and she's part of this family whether you admit it or not. Clara Kosliev, the doe-eyed daughter of the first man I ever ordered to be killed, has lived in this house if only to taunt me. Her bright smile, playful but defiant demeanor, as well as her vibrant and youthful everyday presence in my home has continuously forced me to remember what I did to bring her into it. Yet still, I shelve no grief in remembering what her father did to earn his due. After Enzin was relieved of his life, I had his wife, Clara's biological mother, dispensed of as well. Unlike her husband's punishment of death, Amer Kosliev was given one better. Due to her knowledge of her husband's attempt to betray me, I forbade her from having any relations whatsoever with her daughter. After my order was issued, no one ever heard from her again. However, I hadn't planned for what was to happen next. Once word got to Faina in regards to what I'd done, my determined little sister insisted we take the child into our home until she could find one better suited for her. There isn't a lot I wouldn't do for Faina as long as what she asks is within my power. Because of this, I allowed the girl to stay. 
As two years passed with Clara never leaving, I finally resigned myself to the fact that Faina never had any intention of sending her away. Due to my own guilt in having to prevent Faina from having the life she's always wanted, I relented my directive to be rid of the girl. However, I've carefully avoided her at every turn. Meals I take to my study or my room. Daily discussions I have with family are done so mainly in private. Days, sometimes a week, can pass where I'm able to forget her existence. I don't relish in recollecting any further memories of the night I learned what I was capable of. Nor does that green-eyed girl, I'm certain. Pushing back in my chair, I state, whether you consider her anything more than a guest in our home is up to you. But her time with us is coming to an end. Rolling her eyes, Faina stands, rests the palms of her hands on my desk and leans down to get closer. I brace for the disappointment she so often voices while addressing me. Clara has been a part of our lives since she was a child, and she'll always be welcome in mine, V. She snaps, mimicking the name with which the girl refers to me. Clara was young, only five years old, the dark night we met. She managed to escape the hands of my staff as well as her mother, who was in the kitchen visiting with Faina and Mark. Clara made her way into the shed not far from the house, doing so undetected. Once I pulled her from the room, carrying her back to the house, I refused to look at her directly. Before I could be rid of her, she whispered my name as V in my ear. For weeks into months, the resounding echo of her voice burned each of my senses, repeating itself as a sad and tragic serenade which I knew I had composed. After that, I've only corrected her once, providing her with my true and given name. But attesting to her defiance, she continues to call me V. And the girl is incredibly defiant. This pays homage to my sister, who spends too much time teaching her own personal manners and tact. And you would be lucky to have a woman like her in your life. Faina hails. That is, if you take the time to get to know anyone outside your gang of monstrous men. Perhaps my sister is right. Except again, her thoughts and opinions hold little weight. She straightens herself in front of me. I'm leaving for New York on Friday. Uncle has a few issues with the new. You're not going anywhere, I counter before she's finished. We're being threatened, Faina. The entire family. Pileshi is posing to strike. You're not leaving these grounds. Chiro Pileshi? She shudders, the very name scaring her nearly silent. Nodding, I sit back in my black leather chair, rolling a heavy silver metal ball through my fingers, and answer, Yes, he's up to something. I thought you handled him, she questions. How's it possible he's back for more? Faina is partially oblivious to the malicious acts of others. In her eyes, our family does no harm other than when we're being threatened. She knows how our money is made, and because she's part of this family's inheritance, but a woman as well, she also understands she doesn't necessarily get to say on how business is handled. Due to her quick temper and noted disobedience, I've kept as much bloodshed within our operation from her as I've been able. In a tone which brooks no argument, I return, Pileshi isn't your concern, but because he's mine, I can't let you leave. Faina's eyes narrow, fear giving way to her contempt. I've never had much luck issuing orders to her. Not without headache, anyway. I don't have a choice but to go she explains. This isn't me leaving to get away again, Vlad. This is an order from home. Home. My father, once again, is stepping in where he promised he wouldn't. Vori Zaleski doubts my dedication and knowledge to handle all situations as they arise. Undoubtedly, 
the fact has always remained and is as ever painful to admit. I'll be careful, I promise. Abram will make sure I have a seasoned escort. Nothing will happen. He'll see to that, she promises. Abram will see to that, I mindfully agree. But the ever-present threat of her long-time Sicilian enemy still stands as reason to forbid her to go. Chiro Pleshi and his grueling gang of vile and greedy ingrates have recently been caught behind closed doors and in the ear of several of my adversaries. Their knock to trouble has been heard, albeit through the vine of information coming in from trustworthy informants I pay exuberantly to ensure their loyalty. With Pileshi budging his way from his territory in the north, creeping around the city itself and into mine further south, I fear bloodshed will be unavoidable. My sister, who must pass through all of it in some form or another, stands to get caught in its crosshairs. So much risk. While I'm gone, you need to be sure Vanny keeps his schedule, she pleads. I'll be back in a week, just in time for Clara's party, where you promised you'd make an appearance. The party, I remember. When is the big event again? I question with sarcasm. Sighing and rolling her eyes, Faina explains what I already know. Next Saturday. I've worked hard to give her this, Vlad. You won't ruin it. I won't ruin it, I give in. You'll be nice to her, I mean it, she clips, pointing her first finger at me as she narrows her eyes. Faina remains the tyrant I loved when we were kids, the temperamental girl I tormented as a teenager, and now the only woman in my life I trust, explicitly. See to your trip, then, I direct, and don't worry about Venny. He'll be fine with me. I am his father, am I not? Shuffling toward the door, Faina looks back and grins. You are that, big brother. But you're also a pain in the ass. Name calling. I shake my head and tisk. Faina smiles, looking so much like our mother it's uncanny. Her hair is auburn, her eyes amber, and her skin fair. She's a beautiful woman who any man would be lucky to have, even while being full of mischief. Thinking more, I ask, will you be taking the girl with you to New York? Shaking her head, Faina stands straight before using her bullying charm to further taunt. No, Clara will stay here, and you'll look out for her too, or you'll answer to me. Conceding without words, if only to get her out of my office, I nod in answer as she turns to leave. As she does, she nearly runs smack into the same woman she vehemently despises. Katrina takes a step back in the doorway, sneering as she typically does when greeting my sister, then straightens her posture. Her arms cross over her chest and her long, manicured, blood-red painted fingernails tap dance at either elbow. She's a good four inches taller than Faina, and in the heels she's donning she holds the advantage of looking down with a scowl. Faina, you're looking well, Katrina utters in greeting. Faina turns in place, sardonically smiling at me then turns back to Katrina and snidely questions. Don't you have work to do? Katrina closes the distance between them and bends her neck to get in Faina's face. If I placed a bet on who'd win in a physical altercation, I'd say my little sister would tear a Katrina to shreds. Faina may stand only about five foot three as she's inherited so much from our mother, but she's a powerhouse nonetheless. Needless to say, I don't have time for any of this, so I insist, Faina, you are on your way out. Katrina, come in and tell me what it is you need. Standing back, Katrina's gaze comes to mine. Fine, fine, Faina mocks, never letting one go. Vlad, 
I'll see you before I go. You will. Satisfied once my sister has left, Katrina takes two steps into my office. The cat-like smile she wears as she walks toward me is telling. She's up to something. I don't have time for you today, Katrina, I bluntly explain, not bothering to hide my annoyance in regards to yet another of her surprise visits to my home. Tapping her fingernails along the edge of my desk as she comes to stand at my side, Katrina looks down and quietly studies my mood. She coyly smiles before jumping up to make herself comfortable directly in front of me. Crossing her legs and playing with a glass paperweight from my desk, she complains, Your sister is a tyrant. She says the same about you, I return. Why are you here? Getting to the heart of her visit, she starts, Clara's party. You're not invited, I quickly inform. The guest list is extended to family and close friends only. You're neither. I think I made this clear once already. Ignoring my remark, she pushes, I can help. Faina has a lot on her plate. The answer is no. Your services are not required there. You'll do as I say, and you'll stay away. My services? she repeats. Yes, Katrina. That's what I said. Her face reddens, her anger palpable. Is that really what you want? You want me to stay away? I have work, as do you. Get out of my office and go do it. Standing, Katrina pouts but does as instructed. On her way to the door, she turns, cocking her eyebrow before she offers, If you change your mind and want me to go with you to the little one's party, you know where to find me. Little one. Katrina has no inclination at all that Clara is more woman than she could ever be. The two couldn't be more different. And I don't need a taste of both to know this. Close my door on the way out, I instruct as a goodbye. 2. Clara Come on, Clara, you know Dad will never let me go. Then he pouts, frowning as he slinks back in his chair. The lavish room he studies in boasts high ceilings, lush dark carpet, and white decorative pillars. The area itself is referred to as a reading room, but doubles as a study where Venny spends time learning more than he learns at school. There's a desk which resembles one you'd find in a high school classroom, positioned in front of a large board that hangs from a wall. Three times a week, Faina insists he be given additional lessons to get and stay ahead of the other boys his age. Then he detests the extra work and doesn't consider further education an opportunity. Why would you want to go to New York anyway? Being that he's a 16-year-old boy, his excitement in visiting a place so far from here is understandable. He wants to get away from what he knows and start experiencing things he's never had the chance to before. He's his father's son, and will soon begin to learn the ways of this world as V did. I don't really know my family, just my grandparents, dad, and Faina. I have more out there. Shrugging, he frowns and turns his attention to his dog, Maximus. The large blonde and brown Laika sits studiously at his side, lavishing in the attention Venny gives with each pass of his hand. V's dog lies near Venny's feet, unmoving. Meridius is the larger of the two, colored in dark silvers and grays. He's aloof, never allowing interruptions to take away from his mid-morning nap. Have patience, Ven. I'm sure you'll go soon. I understand his passion for wanting to meet his family. The same family Faina is leaving soon to visit. Only this time I won't be going with her. I'll be here with Venny and his dad. V, as I've called him since I can remember, has never said anything malicious or done anything to harm me. He's always protected me as one of his own. Yet, because he still considers me a traitor's daughter, he's also always held me at arm's length. As I grew, I started growing curious of the man who led this family. His relationship with Faina has always been comfortable, natural. His son's the same. 
I've always felt safe with him, yet have hardly spoken to him at all. There were also times when V caught me studying him closer than I should have been. His large, muscular frame, standing above any other man I've ever known, is breathtaking in stature. His deeply accented green eyes could be stunning, if they ever truly smiled. I imagine his coarse voice, vibrating with command, would be sweet, if its tone ever gentled. I have only vague memories of the night I opened the door to the old shed and found what V had been doing to my father. My dad wasn't a good man. He wasn't nice to my mom. I remember he'd drink often and a lot when he was home. During his absences, mom always worried where he was, who he was with, and what he was doing. She tried to keep her unhealthy curiosity from me, but even at my young age, I knew something between my parents was missing. I like to believe my father loved us both the way a man should love his family, the way V loves his. But since he's gone, I'll never really know. After accepting the loss of my parents, I settled in with Faina and the other men I soon grew to love. The transition was difficult, and I was young and scared. Having Venny around, though, even when he was so small, I gradually started to feel as if I belonged. Venny became the sibling I never knew I wanted. Dad says Uncle Nikolay came from Russia to live here. My aunt and cousins came with him. It would be nice to meet them, you know? You're sixteen, buddy, I point out. How will you get to New York City on your own? With his bright blue eyes dancing with excitement, he replies, That's easy. I'll ask Aunt Faina to take us. Us. As the years have passed with Venny and I growing up together, he's pledged his loyalty to me in many ways. Incessantly so, Venny has vowed to those who will listen that I'm not an outsider to his family, but an equal member who just happens to have a different last name. There's no denying my love for him, and especially not for Faina. She's become like a second mother to me in all ways. Even as a child, she cared for me when I was sick, assured me of my fears toward the men who work for V, and ensured I had everything I needed to exist where I was able. But... That's what my life has come to be, an existence, the hope of one day packing a bag, walking away from the only home I've ever known, and leaving the few here I love behind has faded. I don't know that I could leave in hope of finding more than I already have. Not letting this go, Venny presses. Do you think Aunt Faina would take us if I asked? I don't know, I answer him honestly. Maybe? The air in the room turns rigid. The sliver of nervousness I'm used to feeling slithers up my spine, stinging the back of my neck as my hair stands on end. Both Maximus's and Meridius's tails begin to wag as they each move to all fours before trekking toward the visitor at the door. The raspy voice I sometimes hear in the house in the dark of night breaks into the room. Vinyamin, why are you talking about New York? As Venny and I turn our focus his way, V stands alone just inside the door, using his hand to signal the dogs to stop coming at him. He doesn't make a move to touch them. Rather, sensing their master's disposition, they drop their heads and obediently sit at his feet. V's wearing a faded black T-shirt. The muscles of his defined chest and arms scream in protest of its tight fit. His camouflage pants are faded in color. The pocket on the side is full of whatever he always carries. His black boots are scuffed, much like the stubble on his jaw. His entire being demands a person's unwavering attention. V's eyebrow cocks, and he turns to stare openly in my direction. The accusation and annoyance in his gaze directs me to stay quiet. Breaking the stringent tie between his father and me, Venny insists... Aunt Faina says, your Aunt Faina says too much. V snaps in return. Right, Venny sarcastically comments. At the same time, V takes two steps into the room. I stand from my chair and take three back. I've learned that with practice and agility, hiding in the shadows and waiting for him to leave comes easier than standing up against the monster masking himself as a man. Aunt Faina told me Uncle Nikolai has seven kids, Venny proclaims doing all he can to hide his excitement and play it cool in front of his dad. 
And some of those kids have kids, too. Vinyaman, V warns. Undeterred, Venny errantly continues. I have cousins, Dad. Cousins I want to meet. Tersely, V disregards Venny's excitement and commands, Get your books and come with me. But we haven't finished, he objects, turning his gaze to mine. Miss Clarice is coming back and I'm supposed to... Interrupting Venyman's plan, V lifts his hand to quiet him. You are finished. Now you'll do as I tell you. I watch the excitement in Venny's expression fall to defeat. If I were braver, I'd explain to V that he's missing an important opportunity with his son, a chance to share in his excitement of learning about a family he's so eager to meet. However, I know when and where to pick my battles, so I say nothing. Huffing with his teenage pout, Venny pins me with an annoyed look. I'll come find you later. We'll hang out before dinner, cool? Reluctantly, my eyes reach V's. In reaction to his son's statement, his narrow. Nodding, I reply, but do it quietly. I'll be around, Ben. Satisfied, Venny turns in place to grab his books. Sensing his son's disappointment, V reaches for the back of Venny's neck and pulls him closer before ruffling his hair. Venny utters under his breath, then shoots me a glare and warning not to laugh. He's always hated when his dad makes him feel like a kid. This includes all outward displays of affection, even if V doesn't give these often. Finally, once his son has settled, V uses Venny's shoulder to aim his lanky body toward the door. See ya, Clara. Venny bids. Later, Venny. V orders his son to do something, but I can't hear from where I sit. Venny nods before I hear his mumbled, right, at the same time he shrugs. Once he's out of sight, V rests one broad shoulder against the door jamb and crosses his arms over his chest. The thick veins in his arms bulge. He's studying me closely, not appearing as tense as he did when he arrived. I'm suddenly curious if V has ever truly smiled. If he has, I also wonder if true happiness is an emotion he's honestly capable of possessing. As physically frightening as the man in front of me seems to be, there's a side to him he's rarely ever shown, a gentler side I've only seen glimpses of when he's with Venny, Faina, or those he deems worthy to be himself around. I wish I were privy to that part of him he must hold so deep beneath his surface. Breaking the silence and my thoughts, V observes, In many ways, my son takes after his aunt. He does. I concur. Unfortunately, but like Faina, Venyaman thinks only with his heart. And you don't agree the heart is capable of thought, I assume. He shakes his head. No, I don't. Venyaman has hopes and dreams as a boy his age should. Venyaman is sixteen years old now. V reminds me, brushing off my intent. V needs to start understanding the ways of this world as they truly are. I think he knows the ways of the world, V. He watches you even if you don't think he does. Shock and surprise cross his face, maybe some irritation at my tone. He used to tell me he wanted to be like you, I put in, unsure if Venny would want me sharing, but feeling V should know. Yes, V agrees. Yes, as in, maybe he used to. I don't think he does anymore. He does, but it's possible he doesn't know how to tell you that himself, no matter. V dismisses, visibly torn on what to do with what I've told him. Do me a favor, will you? Be sure you aren't feeding these hopes and dreams, as you call them. Nothing good comes from feeling as if you failed. And if Benjamin hopes for too much, he'll inevitably fail. I wasn't, I try to explain. Failure leads to disappointment. He concludes, not letting me finish. Quickly, before he cuts me off entirely, I defend. Venny's excited to know his family. And when I'm ready for him to, he will. Until then, you won't encourage him. I won't encourage him. I promise. Before turning to leave, these eyes narrow. Not in anger, but something else. Curiosity, maybe? He scans my face, neck, and body. Not that he hasn't seen me before, but... 
This is different. Unnerving. Awkward. Uncomfortable. There's no way to know and no need to ask, because before I can inquire about what he may be thinking, he turns around to walk away. 3. Vlad Luciana made this especially for you, Abram states, appreciating the dish his wife prepared. She wanted to invite you to dinner at the house, but I told her you'd say no. And I would say no. I've no doubt Abram and his wife's company would be kind, that their table would be set with various French delicacies. Prayers given to God and thanks would be dispersed, and the evening would end with light conversation over a chilled bottle of white wine. However, Faina left for New York two days ago, and I still haven't spoken to her directly. I heard she arrived there with our family safely, but she's been avoiding my calls and not returning my messages. She knows I worry so when I do finally get a hold of her, it may only be to wring her small neck. Tell Luciana thank you from me, I return, grabbing the dish, covering it up, and setting it in the refrigerator. The kitchen Faina decorated in stainless steel and blood-red walls is located on the main floor of the house. The sliding glass door opens up to the backyard, where most times the dogs can be found guarding the house as they should. This is also the room I often come to during the night when I am alone and can't sleep. Mock, the older woman in charge of the house, keeps everything clean and stocked. The small table where she sits to do most of her work is often the only clutter that can be seen. I'll tell her but she'll be demanding you make a visit soon. Abram Willis is my closest confidant. My father trusts him as well, yet Abram and I don't have the typical working relationship that my father would want. After all these years together, Abram, as well as a select few of my men, are able to speak their minds in front of me. However, they all know the final word in any circumstance is mine. Unfortunately, Abram also considers himself to be my self-appointed spiritual guide. He's not a man of God, per se. He can't be, considering the countless lives he's ended. Even so, Abram strongly believes in the divine power that a life after this one exists. I don't share his faith, yet my lack of belief doesn't deter him from trying to convert me to his. Vlad, are you all right? Abram queries with concern. You seem distracted. I'm fine, I lie. Are you worried about Faina? She's rubbing you wrong on purpose. That sister of yours never knows when to stop. You're right, she doesn't. She's safe, friend, Abram assures. She won't take off again. Faina's grown. She's matured. No, she won't take off again. Fifteen years ago, my sister woke up, packed a few things, walked out of our home on her own free will, and didn't look back. At the time, she was only turning eighteen. She called on occasion, telling me she was taking time away. One month turned into two, then three. I could have hunted her down, forced her home. I didn't. Part of me understood that Faina was a woman, living a life under watchful guard, surrounded by men who most times she had no tolerance for. She returned nearly a year later, but she did it with a heavy heart and under the direct threat of our father. Faina never apologized to anyone, nor did she make any attempt to excuse her absence. To this day I still haven't forgiven her. The fear she'll run again with so many threats looming is always present. My sister's selfishness is what happened, I subject. And you're right. She won't be disappearing for so long again. Worrying yourself over what Faina may or may not do won't do you any good. 
Grabbing a cold bottle of beer, I shut the refrigerator door and then lean my lower back against the kitchen counter next to it. My shoulders are tense, my head is pounding, and the taste of pending death has unremarkably settled into my gut. Changing the direction of conversation, Abram jokingly states, When he told Alina that he and Clara are planning to visit New York in the fall, Tilting my head toward the ceiling, I close my eyes and take in a breath while mentally cursing Faina's overactive indulgence wherever my son is concerned. Abram smirks. I'm sure Faina had a hand in putting that idea into his head. Vanny isn't going anywhere, I assure, at least until he's old enough to know why he's going to visit. He's sixteen, Vled. He's old enough now, when you're his age. In my life, Vinyamin follows suit with Faina. I've done all I've been able to shield him from the life I lead. With my father still stationed in Russia, and no one else here to make decisions on my behalf, I've gone against all his wishes in bringing Veni into the life I know he'll eventually succumb to. As far as I'm concerned, the longer Venny is free to be who he is without the complications, the better. He'll go when I'm ready for him to go, I restate. What about the girl? The girl. Funny how Abram refers to Clara as such, yet only ever doing so in my company. I've seen them with her myself. When she was a child, Abram looked after her around the house during his visits. He'd teach her simple math using his fingers or spelling sight words as the opportunities arose. He'd make her laugh with funny faces or by tickling her until she begged him to stop. As an adult, Clara intrigues him as she intrigues most members of this house, including me. With her young and understated beauty, it's as if she holds the power to hypnotize whoever she chooses. A man doesn't need to see to the heart of her, her stubbornness or sensitivity, to understand she's a rare, one-of-a-kind woman with dignity, self-respect, and grace. The girl isn't going anywhere either, I tell him. My sister doesn't believe that, but I do. Abram laughs. He is also well-versed in how unwavering Faina's determination can be. You need to get Faina married off, Vlad. She's thirty-two years old and causing you more headache than she has a right to. Nodding, I agree. Other than listening to my son about the big trips he's planning to New York, how is little Alina doing? Alina is a six-year-old crippled girl who was born in France. At the age of two, she came to live with Abram and Lucienne. Lucy, as we all call her, had been spending the summer visiting her parents, where she heard about an old but still operating orphanage. According to Abram, the moment his wife set eyes on Elena, lying in a bed, being blatantly ignored by most visitors, she fell in love. Subsequently, she then felt compelled to save the little girl from a life of solitude. No one knows why Elena has never taken a single step, but her condition has never mattered. Once the adoption went through, Abram took her to see several specialists who all concluded an accident as an infant caused her paralysis. Being that Elena was so young when it happened, we were thankful that not only did she not remember the accident, but that she was strong enough to survive it as well. I admire Luciana's kind heart. She's not so different than my sister or Clara. Yet Lucy doesn't live the life of the organization other than by Abram's extension. Which, if he keeps his work from his wife the way I try to keep my work from the women in this house, is to say she doesn't truly live the life at all. Elena is doing great, he reports, walking to the kitchen table cluttered in dishes and pans. He moves a few to the side, giving us both room before he sits. 
You have something else to discuss, I speculate, when Abram hesitates. I take a seat in the chair next to his. What is it? I'm not sure, with Faina acting out that I should. Tell me, I insist. You're my closest friend, Abram. We don't keep secrets. He sighs. The aging lines around his dark eyes, paired with those around his mouth, reflect his worry. Abram is ten years older than I am. His dark hair has prematurely started to gray, most likely due to his line of work in dealing with so much of mine. His broad chest rises as he takes in a breath before he counters. As your closest advisor, we don't keep secrets. As your closest friend, I hate to worry you. Tell me, I insist again. Shaking his head and exhaling, he states, There was a man outside the gates. A man? He nods. He had a camera. A professional one. What? When was this? Tonight. Gleb called me at home. He didn't want to upset you, as you've been as busy as you've been. But he wanted to let someone know he handled it on his own. How so? Abram smiles. Let's say the unwelcome visitor didn't state his business quickly enough, so Gleb and Ruan handled it. Gleb is an older gentleman and head of my mansion security. He holds a crucial position within the organization. Watching over my sister and all who she employs can be daunting for anyone. But Gleb handles Faina with care. His cut in profit is high, and the information he receives is just as high. I trust him, as he's been with me now for many years. However, I only trust him so far. Ruan is the youngest member of the family. At the age of eighteen, he came to me after hearing rumors on the street about what our family does. He has to be given legitimate work, things he could do to earn extra money. After a year, I found that not only had he earned the money he was paid, but he had earned the trust of my men as well. I brought him in, and now, at twenty-three, he's one of my most dedicated soldiers. He lacks experience, but working under Gleb will give him this without question. We'll have to respond to Chiro's bait soon, Abram advises. The idiot has been quiet too long. You suppose the man who was handled was one of Chiro's? Looking unsure, Abram states, If he was, he certainly didn't own up to it and Gleb said Ruan gave him ample opportunity before he broke his jaw. Christ, I hiss. Who knows? He could have been innocent. No one is innocent. If we find out it's Chiro, another statement needs to be sent, Vlad. He worries. And it should be done soon. Yes, I agree before taking another drink and setting the bottle on the table at my side. Sending a message of demonstration has consequences. The same consequences which should still serve to remind Chiro of the penalty he paid the last time he crossed his boundaries. The? Clara's small voice calls out, causing both Abram and my head to turn. Clara stands at the kitchen's entrance wearing a bright yellow summer dress that ties at the back of her neck the hem stopping mid-thigh. Her long blonde hair, which is usually pulled back, falls haphazardly against her exposed bronzed shoulders. I didn't mean to interrupt. Mog said I have chores. Come in, Clara, Abram happily invites. Standing and then walking to her, he bends at the waist to kiss her cheek, then grabs her hands and compliments. You're looking as pretty as ever. How are you? My hands ball to fists at his casual greeting. My back tenses as Clara walks two steps to gain distance in order to pass where I sit. Hi, Abram, she greets with a nod on her way to the sink. I'm good, thank you. 
I hear you have a birthday coming up this weekend, he remembers. A big one. Clara looks to me with surprise. Abram catches her hesitance and offers, Faino reminded me before she left that we're all going to help you celebrate. Clara's eyes roll before she closes them. Pink blushes her cheeks. I don't need a party to celebrate. Faina insisted I do. Well, of course she did. That feisty woman would throw a party every Tuesday for no reason if Lad would let her. Clara laughs, a quiet and sweet sound, before asking, Can I get you anything? I'm leaving, unfortunately, he insists. Lucy's made dinner for Vlad. He hasn't eaten today, and rather than listen to my advice, he'd prefer to starve. There's plenty in there. He points to the fridge. Help yourself. I... She tries to speak, most likely to deny him, but Abram cuts her off. Eat, Clara, he instructs, though doing it gently. Lucy would be devastated to hear her best dish went to waste. When Clara turns her head, her eyes hold mine. Disregarding Abram, she questions, You haven't eaten today? I don't answer. Instead, I take another drink from the bottle. After a subtle clearing of her throat, she presses. V. Abram peers down at me and knowingly smirks. I return his expression with a leer. In response, he slaps my shoulder as he passes on his way to the door. I'll call you if I hear anything else. Get some rest and mind your manners. I listen as Clara moves around behind me, but she doesn't say anything more. Abram's eyes scan Clara's body up and down before he moves them toward me and grins while still speaking to her. In a low, subtle voice laced with what I'm certain is appreciation, Abram says, Clara, as always it's been a pleasure. See that you keep Vlad company. He's tense. Surely there's something you can do for him. As I turn in place to find her, Clara loses focus on what she was doing. Her green eyes widen before frantically falling to mine. Her shocked expression dims as he walks out, leaving the two of us alone. My sister has been gone only two days, and now I'm face to face with her, for lack of better term, disobedient pet and I'm doing this after watching the most honest man I've ever known eagerly peruse her young, blossoming body. Unfortunately, I can't blame him at all. She's difficult to ignore. Clara grabs a small towel to wipe her hands, then leans her back against the counter while studying me. You can go, I instruct. Rather than accept the invitation to leave, she insists, I'll make you a plate and... Standing, hands fisted in irritation, I turn in her direction. Not necessary. I'm not hungry. But Faina said I was to... To what? Tell me, I snap, aiming my rigidity at anything I can and finding her as target. There are many things Clara could do to relieve my tension. None of them are good for either of us to consider. Angry at the visions preying on my mind, I push my annoyance back her way. Tell me what you think you could do. Looking down in submission, Clara drops the towel on the counter before nervously threading her fingers together. Her body is slack, and her voice is shaky as she admits, Faina told me I needed to look after you. A heinous laugh escapes my chest. Grabbing my beer from the table, I down the rest of it in one drink, hoping to aid my already threadbare nerves. Once I finished, I lift the bottle in her direction. You'll get me another drink, and then you'll go. Clara's eyes narrow, which is typical. She's never much cared for my blunt and direct way of giving orders. 
and I've never much cared to curtail them. Errantly traipsing her way to the refrigerator, she passes me with a quickened step. The light waft of soft lilacs teases my senses. Time has been virtuous to the girl in all ways. With each passing year, the delicate grace she carries adds another reminder to how much of it has passed. Her once young and awkward body now sanctions the opulent features of a grown woman, her hair thick and glossy, her skin fresh and clean. She's no longer the child following Faina around at all hours of the day. Clara has grown into her own woman by aging right. Other than to feed my desires with Katrina or other whores from my stables, I don't remember the last time I've been alone in the company of a woman. Years have passed since I've shared a bed with a woman untouched by so many before me. Not to mention how long it's been since I've been left alone with her, the daughter of the first man I ever ordered killed. Faina believes Clara to be an equal among this family. Through resentful curiosity, I've often wondered if Clara has ever felt the same. Sitting back down in my chair, I position it in her direction and watch. Not only is Clara pulling out another beer, but she's also pulled out the dish Abram's wife saw necessary to send over. The white ceramic plate, now laden with mass amounts of French cuisine, rests on the counter as Clara fusses over it. The Flamiche is still warm. To my surprise, Clara recognizes the French dish. I have work to do in the kitchen, so if you'd like you can eat dinner in your study. Coming to stand beside me, Clara avoids my eyes. I said I wasn't hungry. And I promised Faina I'd look out for you, she clips. I can take this to your study. No, I return, dismissing my usual terseness. And just set it on the table. Continuing to avoid my gaze, she sets it down in front of me before placing a fresh beer next to it. The top hem of her yellow sundress dips in the front, revealing the pale pink garment she wears under it. Another testing tease of her scent lingers. Her hair. That's what smells of blossomed lilacs. Now go, I snap, regretting having noticed her at all. 4. Chiro Chiro sits behind his dark mahogany desk tapping his fingers against the shiny wood and staring into the eyes of a man so desperate and angry he dared to walk into his office, his home, for help. Osef Embers The Sicilian boss carefully considers how best to handle this gifted opportunity. Vlad Zaleski deserves to suffer a great pain after all he put him through. Because of the Russian leader, He'd had to start his family and his business over again from the ground up. Finding men worthy to employ, testing their loyalty and trust as well as their resolve, and positioning his operations to profit took time he couldn't afford. The last fifteen years have been daunting. Time has taken a toll on Chiro, as well as those who depend on him. However, motivated by revenge and driven with the patience to see it through, he thinks he may have found a small chink in Vlad's armor, and it's one he's considering utilizing. Vlad's weakness is most likely the girl, Clara Kosliev. He'd always known the traitor's daughter lived there. In fact, he feels responsible for her life turning out as it did. Enzin Kosliev wanted something for himself, a name. He came to Chiro for a trade. If Enzin sold Chiro information regarding the Zaleski operation, Chiro in turn agreed to compensate him, generously. However, the stupid fool failed to cover his tracks, and Vlad's man, Abram Wheelis, figured out the scheme before Enzin was done seeing it through. His new plan may take time, and it may cost him his own already corrupted soul to complete. 
Yet Chiro can't help but bask in the vision of Vlad on his knees, begging for mercy once and for all. So, your sister, Chiro starts to summarize, wanting the man out of his sight. Osef nods, adjusting his posture in his seat. Yes, her name was Amer. Amer, Chiro tests the name. You say she's dead. She killed herself a year ago. But I'll tell you again, Vlad Zaleski is responsible. How so? Osef's eyes narrow with disgust. He took her little girl away from her. Amer loved Clara so much. Chiro tenses, sensing Osef is not being completely truthful. During their entire conversation, Osef has given no intimate details regarding Clara or his alleged dear little sister, Amer. Chiro remains skeptical. Osef's cheap beige suit and the amount of dirt and grime in his slicked back hair prove he's a liar, if only in appearance. The dark rings beneath his nearly black eyes and his ashen skin, along with his sunken cheekbones, indicate the man in front of him regularly uses drugs. The deplorable amount of filth beneath his fingernails turns Chiro's gut. The Sicilian leader has had experience with men just like the one staring at him now. Those experiences cause him hesitation. Leaning forward, Chiro clasps his hands together and twines his fingers in a fold. You tell me you haven't seen Clara since she was a small girl, and neither had Amer before she died. That's correct, Osef confirms. Yet you waited all these years to come find your long-lost niece? The one you tell me you've missed so much. I haven't always been well, Osef admits to Chiro's surprise. At the time she was taken, I was living in Boston. I was working the docks and couldn't care for Clara then. But you can now that she's an adult. Yes. Ridiculous. Let me see what you've got there. Chiro instructs, snapping his fingers across his desk. Handing him the photograph of Clara standing with another woman outside a local market, Osef explains. This was taken a few months ago. I wanted to be sure it was really her before I approached Vlad. The picture confirms everything Chiro hoped was true. The loving way Vlad's boy is watching Clara laugh. The protective stance Vlad's sister takes next to them both. Clara appears to be the heart of them, and if that heart were to stop beating... If all you say is true, why haven't you gone to Vlad already? After finding out this is your Clara, as you say, why are you in my office and not his? Better yet, why haven't you approached your niece personally? Osif's jaw clenches, his temples protruding with each grind of disdain. His lips draw tight, and his hands on his lap ball into fists. I had planned on that, but the last man I paid to visit the Zaleski home to ensure Clara was there never came back with more pictures or for his payment. Chiro takes this in as no shock. Anyone stupid enough to step foot near the gates of the Russian home would assuredly be risking their life. When she leaves the house, the young boy is usually with her, Osif states, pointing to the picture. He and that woman watch her very closely. Yes, Chiro mindfully agrees. Vinyamin Zaleski is growing up. He's his father's son and will soon step into the role his father has made ready for him. As for the sister, Faina, she could be of use as well. I understand you want your family back, if Clara is indeed your family. And I understand you need my help. However, I can't get involved yet. But I thought... Lifting a hand, Chiro quiets Osef. What is it you really want from me? Help getting Clara. What will you do once you have her? I... 
I... Osif stutters. She must be worth something. There it is. Chiro notes his instincts weren't wrong. Osef is crooked. A lifelong liar and petty thief. He's aiming now for a much larger and lucrative payout. Chiro feigns surprise as he accepts the bait, if only to test Osef's resolve. I'll leave it to you to get to Clara, then. If you do, you bring her here. I can either pay you what you think she's worth, or make it so you both safely disappear together. But doing this alone will take so much time, and the resources I don't have. What's your rush? Chiro questions abruptly. You've waited this long already. I don't know. Tired of dealing with this liar, Chiro sternly advises, You do what you choose to do. That's all the advice I can give you. Don't you think? That is all I can give you, Chiro states again. Xavier will see you out. As Osef stands to leave, Xavier, Chiro's top enforcer, moves forward from his position by the door. Xavier nods to Chiro, then looks to Osef before grabbing the top of his arm to lead the way. When they make it to the door, Chiro's confidant and advisor, Pete, steps inside the room. His eyes follow the men until the door closes behind them. How much did you hear? Chiro questions. While Pete takes a seat, Chiro notes his oldest friend's weary expression. More times than not, Pete's conscience to do good with all they've been given gets in the way of the dirty business that must be done to keep it running. I heard enough. And? Chiro prods. And I think you're up to something. Care to share? Chiro momentarily considers Pete, a smaller man than he in stature, but more powerful in will and mind. He's known Pete for decades, having grown up together. If there's anyone he trusts to help him spin this opportunity to the Peleshi advantage, it's him. I don't know everything yet. I'm still processing why Osif came to me with this. As far as Vlad is concerned, Osef shouldn't be a threat to Clara. An addition to his life, yes, but no threat. But you are, Pete surmises. First, I want to see what Osef will do. I don't trust him. He's lying. And I won't make any moves against Zaleski until I know what moves I can make, if any. And what about Killian? Do you think he and Osif are working together with the Russian? Chiro shakes his head and steeples his hands in front of him. Killian Dawson, the Irish mob boss, knows better. Even if the two heads of families haven't spoken in years, Chiro believes Killian knows his place, and it's not inside his business. No, Killian wouldn't be stupid enough to jeopardize Liam's safety. That's not who he is. But he doesn't know Liam anymore. You've seen to that, Pete begrudgingly accuses. Not now, Pete, Chiro admonishes. Liam, the teenage boy Chiro raised since Liam's parents' death twelve years ago, is the only tie between the Irish and the Sicilian families. Being that he's the product of Chiro's younger sister and Killian's youngest son, Chiro promised peace with the Irish in exchange for sole custody of Liam. Pete has always disagreed, feeling that peace should be given in the wake of Liam's parents' tragic deaths. Chiro protested against the notion of death bringing family together. I'm putting some of the men on Killian, Chiro states. But you just said, for precaution only. If Gillian has anything to do with Osif, or Vlad for that matter, we'll know. And if he does, the long-standing agreement between us will be void. You're playing with fire, Pete insists. Maybe so. But if that's the case, and Gillian has his hand in any of this, it's best not to put it out until some Irish blood is lost in its blaze. Five. Clara.
My eyes opened to the dark at the shattering sound of breaking glass. Three days ago, V dismissed me after I forced a plate of dinner in front of him. Once I left, sheltering a bruised ego, I went to find Venny. He'd been busy in his room, listening to rock music so loud the noise nearly pierced my ears. Venny is his father's son. Him doing whatever he wants, whenever he wants, doesn't come as a surprise. Throughout the last few days, I've chastised myself for attempting to understand how and why V came to be who he is. I've ridiculed my thoughts, imagining him as a child doing the same youthful things Venny does. I've wondered if there was ever a time in his life that Vlad Zaleski felt cherished, cared for, or loved. My curiosity soon led me to the realization that I've never seen a photograph of him, not as a child, teenager, or adult. Did he ever live as freely as Venny's been permitted? Has V ever cared for or loved another person with the same possessive intensity that he has for his sister and his son? I don't imagine he's had many opportunities to have anything more than what he does now, which doesn't appear to be a lot. Breaking through my thoughts, a man's voice violently curses. Standing up, I rub my eyes and make my way out of my bedroom, which is off the kitchen between two housemaids' rooms. After walking down the narrow hallway toward the light shining in from the kitchen, I take a single step around the corner to find V leaning his powerful body against the counter. His light brown hair is scattered in disarray. His camouflage pants are the same as he always wears. His shirt has been removed, his chest bare and on display. His facial expression is a painful combination of sickly and gaunt. It doesn't look as if he slept at all. The clock above the stove reads 2.22 a.m. Clara, he sighs, aimlessly lifting his hands in the air. I need help. Swallowing hard, I stare at his other hand. The blood is dripping in streaks. The thickening beads trek down his arm, forming thicker drops as they fall to the dark ceramic floor, where they end in a splatter against broken glass. In quick steps, I make my way to him, as I do, the residual crystal of the tumbler pierces the bottom of my foot. I wince, but don't stop moving forward. Grabbing a towel, I gently cover his palm first before securing the towel in place. You're good with your hands, he scathingly teases, a small, cruel smile claiming his lips. The touch of a woman, both swift and deliberate. V's never spoken a crass word to me. Yes, sometimes I'm treated with his indifference, but he's never intentionally made me feel uncomfortable. Shaking off my weary nerves, I turn my concentration to the cloth, spreading the material thin to cover the gaping, bleeding wound. The sticky blood adheres to my fingertips. I wonder if you're as good with your mouth. He taunts further. I've thought about how good your lips would taste on mine, if I forced you to let me feel them. The tense heat in my chest rushes to my face, flushing my skin and covering it in a sheen of sweat. My mouth opens, taking in a badly needed breath. V reaches toward me and, using the pad of his thumb, caresses my bottom lip as I hold his injured hand in both of mine. His touch is warm and inviting, however disturbingly so. His eyes grow dark as he watches our connection, giving it his complete attention. Your face is red, beautiful girl. You're wondering how mine would taste now, too. I... Visions of what Vlad and I would look like together, giving in to heated desperation, flood my senses. My insides pulse, considering how he may feel driving himself into me without restraint. I wonder what he would think or say if he knew it's him I think of so many times when I'm alone. Tell me I'm wrong he insists, that you aren't curious about how hard you'd come at my touch. Nearly speechless, I gasp. I don't don't lie to me. You're drunk, I accuse. That's how you hurt yourself. Vlad's eyebrows arch at my tone. My observation clearly hit a nerve. I'm not drunk enough that I didn't smell your innocence coming at me from across the room, he hisses. V. I whisper urgently, focusing on his eyes as they stay trained to my mouth. I need to look at your hand. 
I swallow hard as the stench of smoke and whiskey reclaim my lost concentration. When he doesn't take his hand away from my chin, I roughly pull back, distancing myself from his touch. Once free, I pull his wrist closer in order to add pressure to the wound, leaning his head forward, his mouth now inches from mine, the mist of the alcohol and the stale stench from his cigarette coat my face. V doesn't smoke, which attests to his state of drunkenness. You have no reason to pull away from me. He steadily simmers. I won't hurt you. At his simple promise, I part my lips to agree, but nothing comes out. Sensing I'm still scared, he reaches up and brushes away the hair falling into my eyes. His voice gentles as he asks, Do you believe me? That I won't hurt you? Yes, I reply, the flutters in my stomach waking more confusion in my head. A hazy confliction fills V's eyes as they glisten. In their dark centers, I make out my own reflection. Uncertainty bellows between us, the sight of V's tongue darting out to trace his bottom lip, along with the finger he's using to trace the apple of my cheek, holds me captive. Outwardly, V is a handsome man. The strong contours of his face, the rigidity of his body, the dark complexion of his skin, the untamed abrasiveness in his voice when he speaks directly to anyone. He's the epitome of a beast— stepping into the sun and puffing its chest before exhaling fire, announcing itself to the world in all its terrifying glory. However, Vlad Zaleski is more than just beautifully magnificent. He's also a terror of mass destruction, a villain without a cause, a tormentor of the weak, a tyrant to the lost. And I'll never forget. Fix this, he growls, straightening once more. His voice is low and restrained as he pushes his injured hand toward my face. Once he's released his hold, he steps away and weakly points to the kitchen table. Over there. Mock's first aid kit is in the main bathroom, I explain. Sit, I prod, walking at his side and helping to guide his large, highly intoxicated body into a chair. I place his injured hand on the table. Mine covers his and I push down. Apply pressure. Not a lot, but enough to stop the bleeding. Doing as I tell him, he nods and then replies, Don't be long. Returning with everything I'll need, I find V still seated at the table, but resting his head on his arm. His broad shoulders move in sync with each steady breath he takes. Whether he's passed out, sleeping, or merely taking a mindful break, he appears quiet and at peace. My fingers tremble with curiosity. I wonder how the eagle tattooed on his back would feel beneath my fingertips. And I'm curious as to what reaction that same touch would incite from him. Refusing to give either the opportunity and fearing the rejection which would surely follow, I press forward. Walking toward him, I announce, Okay, we're ready. Grabbing the chair next to his, I position and make myself comfortable. When I reach for his hand, he teasingly pulls it back just out of arm's reach. My eyes scan his forearms streaked with protruding veins and dark tattoos, passing up to meet his bulging bicep, directing themselves back to the contours of his exposed chest. I feel him studying my face. He's touching me with his eyes, burning my skin, and basking in my nervousness without my consent. I need to get a better look, I state sternly though under his scrutiny my confidence is weak. Tensing, he allows my touch. When I finally bring myself to chance a look at him, the clenching of his jaw paired with his pulsing temples suggests pain. Or maybe this is his repugnant reaction in having to request my help. Vlad Zaleski doesn't ask for anyone's help, let alone in the middle of the night because of a cut to his hand caused from over-drinking. Do you have the slightest idea what you're doing? He inquires, studiously watching as I unwrap the towel with care. No, not really, I reply. But there's no one here to help. I can wake Mock if you'd rather she... No, he cuts me off. You'll do it. Once the makeshift bandage is removed, I toss it to the side. I need a bowl and water to wash the cut, 
I explain. It takes no more than a minute to ensure the tap water is warm before filling the glass bowl and carrying it back to the table. I hadn't noticed the intensity of Vlad's gaze until I'm again standing at his side. You're frightened, he callously assumes, looking up. Before I can respond, he adds, You're terrified of me. Hearing his clearly stated observation and hating the manner in which he nonchalantly claims it, I sit, taking his hand and laying the back of it flush against my open palm. Blood continues to drip, hitting the side of my wrist before trailing into the water and tainting it pink. Tell me, Clara, he starts. With his upper body's adjustment, I envision he's tilted his head to the side, but I don't lift my eyes to confirm. How old will you be on Saturday? Remembering the party Faina has planned and wondering if V will be there, I answer simply. Twenty-one. Twenty-one, he ponders to myself. And I was right earlier. You've never been touched before, have you? My eyebrows furrow before a disturbing awareness steals my spine. I lift my eyes to his to find he's not being facetious. His question is honest, almost thoughtfully sincere. The change of his disposition is a direct difference from what I've always known him to be. But it's also a glimpse of the shielded edge of him I've always suspected he's kept buried deep. Touched? Leaning toward me, another current of smoke and whiskey fans my face. You've been alone here, in my home, all this time. All these years, I assume no man under my roof would touch my property without permission. So, I can assume the only person who's ever brought you pleasure is... My face flushes. While it's true no man has ever touched me, I've also never openly discussed the intimate act of giving myself pleasure with anyone, especially V, a man I find fascinating beyond compare to any and all others a man I've not only looked up to all my life, but one I've become dangerously curious about, the only man my thoughts turn to when I'm alone in my room at night. Cutting him off, I answer, No, there's been no one else. My hands shake as I carefully continue pulling pieces of the pebbled glass from his palm. In reaction to my dedicated ministrations, V's hand abruptly pulls away, he scowls in evident pain before taking in a ragged breath and laying it back on top of mine. But you must have had thoughts about how it feels, he gathers. Most women your age have already been with a man. You must be curious as to what it's like. Fearing his reaction to my answer, in truth or lie, my heart pounds against my chest. The cords in my neck are tight, tensing as I swallow. No, I d don't. I stutter through the lie. I mean, no, I haven't thought about it. Thankfully changing the subject, V acknowledges. Faina tells me you've been doing a lot to help her with her charity work. I have, I answer proudly. V knows about my dedication to her and her various charity projects for children. Faina has taught me a lot. She cares for you. She worries what will happen when the time comes for you to leave here and find a life of your own. My stomach twists. All those years ago, V's killing of my father and banishing of my mother left me alone. V took me into his home, allowing me to become a part of his family. Long ago, the bitterness I felt toward him for taking my father's life faded. I can't imagine a life without Mak, Veni, and Faina, or even Abram, Ruan, and Gleb. I don't know if I have enough life experience to find my way alone. I casually reply, dabbing the open areas of his hand to ensure the glass has been removed. How much is enough? If you're asking, then it means you've thought about leaving before. Yes, I admit. Sometimes. And you never considered running away? All these years, you've never thought of walking out the door while hoping to find a place far from here? Far from me? My eyes sting. Looking down, a single tear falls to land on my wrist. A 
Of course I thought about how my life would be had my parents still been in it. The thought of my mother, whom I adored, summons memories. The memories of the time I had with her remind me of her loss, a loss I've relived mentally more times than I can count. Look at me, Clara. He unobtrusively bids, his voice shallow, dropping to a faded whisper. I refuse his request, continuing to care for his hand. The bleeding has stopped, along with his determination to pull it from my grasp. I think I could find my own way. I finally reply with false honesty. But if you'd left, you'd miss Faina. He submits. And Veni, I include. They're my family. I love them and would miss them terribly. All the work I've done on his hand so far is ruined. At the mention of my admiration for his son, V's hand balls to a fist, crushing my fingers as it does. A sharp pain shoots up my arm when he tightens more. My eyes close. The tears I was holding fall to my cheeks in an uninterrupted cascade of humiliation. You're much older than my son, sweetheart. His coined sentiment sinks my chest. The viciousness in his tone dismisses the endearment as soon as it's heard. And let's not forget that technically, Benjamin is still a child. You're a young woman. Venny is already a young man, I correct, dismissing his insinuated insult. He's not a child, I reply brokenly, refusing to wince in pain again. Often I've looked at Venyamin and wished for more than what I expect this life will give him. He's sixteen, an age to be molded, a precarious time in his adolescence where he can be casted for good or made to be more like his father. Explain, V insists, finally releasing my hand. Thankfully, he no longer appears angry, only curious. Stretching out my crushed fingers below the table so he can't see, I desperately gather my composure. I told you, Venny looks up to you. He admires you, as he should. He tolerates me because he has to. V corrects. Sometimes I don't have the faintest clue how to communicate with him. Then you've missed it. Missed what? Shaking my head, I keep my eyes down to focus on his hand. Like you said, he's sixteen, yet he doesn't really know you or what you do. Do you know? He abruptly questions, a thread of guilt lacing his tone. Nodding, I confirm. Yes, V. Women. Women? You sell them. You've been listening in on more conversations than I had hoped. I've lived here most of my life. Anyone who lives here has to know what you do. Mock knows, too, but she pretends she doesn't. Do you disagree with what my family does? He questions, wrapping his fingers around mine, this time not to hurt me, but to garner my attention. When I look up, V's head is tilted to the side as he waits for my answer. I don't disagree or question any of your decisions. You're lying, he accuses. Shaking my head while holding his eyes, I respond, Not at all. I don't think any of those women are there because they don't want to be. His uninjured hand lifts toward my face. I watch until I can no longer see it, feeling him gathering the hair from my cheek. After he carefully places it behind my ear, his eyes focus on his finger as it trails down my neck. The skin at my throat burns with every passing inch. You're not only a beautiful girl, you're an intelligent one as well. Close to breathless, I collect myself to bring us back to where we were. Then he's a young man who will soon realize he'll be filling his father's shoes. You've given him a lot to live up to. How so? he questions, dropping his hand from my neck. You're Vlad Zaleski, I claim in subtle praise, looking around the vast kitchen adorned in blood-red walls and appliances of stainless steel, a room usually filled with servants. I continue. You came to this country when you were still a young man. You didn't bend to fit into your new world. You forced your new world to bend and fit to you. The motion of his inhaled breath travels the expanse of his chest, 
Just because V has done the many vengeful and disgusting things he's done doesn't mean there's still not a heinous reverence owed to him. He's done what he's done, and as far as I understand, he's done it alone. You've insulted me. He accuses quietly, almost desperately. Clutching his hand in mine, fear obligating me to hold it tightly, I snap my eyes to his. No, I didn't, I argue quickly. I meant what I said in reference to Venny. He has your shoes to fill. Again, so quietly, nearly as a confession, V admits, I don't want my life for him. No? I question, continuing to work on his hand. Although I finished, I'm stalling, attentively curious as to what exactly he would want for Venny. Faina will eventually marry. She's a strong woman who will one day keep a man in his place. She'll rule her husband as she does you, I carelessly convey. The small twitch of a smirk plays at the corners of his mouth, causing the roguish man to appear a slight shade lighter. She'll someday run this family as I do. Through her husband, of course. Of course. Sitting back in his chair, V takes his hand from mine and inspects my work. His fingers bend, then straighten, three times in succession before he's satisfied he'll survive until morning. My son cares for you, he tells me, resting his hand on the table as I pick up the mess around it. A great deal. Nodding, I force myself to slip back into the role I'm here to play— Faina made me promise to watch over V, swearing he wouldn't be a bother. Being woken up at 2.30 in the morning by the crashing sound of a falling tumbler is a bother, yet it's one I'm somehow thankful for. Getting a glimpse of the quiet heart of the beast I've always assumed he was has equally fed my curiosity. With my hands full, I take a step left in order to discard the trash. I wince as the glass I'd forgotten I'd stepped on digs deeper into the arch of my foot— my wrist is caught. I turn in place where I find V looking up with an unnamed expression. You're hurt. I'm not. I cover. V releases my wrist, but my waist is clenched within his grasp as he stands. Using the force of just his hands, V guides my body back to the chair. As he sits, he runs his palm along my upper thigh, stopping to rest behind my knee. Lifting my leg, his injured hand gently reaches for the heel of my foot. This will hurt, he tells me after inspection, but it needs to come out. I'll get it. V's eyes hit mine as he pulls out the sliver of glass. He keeps his gaze attentive as the shard hits the table with a soft clink. Under his warm touch and study of my reaction, I start to fidget. Sit still, he demands. I'm not finished. He uses a cloth from the table, as well as bandages from the box. His grip on my ankle is deliberate, but still somehow tender. His thumb caresses the top of my foot, soothing the pain to pleasure as he sweeps it back and forth. Once he's satisfied I'm no longer in pain, he watches his large calloused hand as it glides along the back of my lower leg, up toward my knee, before resting to stop mid-thigh. Do you remember how you got this scar? He questions, running the pad of his thumb against the faint white line. Yes, I reply, the memory there but nearly as faded as the scar itself. You fell outside on the front stairs. You must have been seven at the time. He recollects, his voice calm and steady. I was eight, I remember. You were there with Abram. Looking up at me, V's smile is genuine. We were cleaning up the yard, after it had stormed. I remember. I told you I didn't want you outside until we could make sure it was safe. I didn't want you or Venny to fall and get hurt. Surprised by his vivid account, I remind, but I did get hurt. You did, because you didn't listen. Moving his gaze to my leg, his hand circles around my entire thigh, where he holds it firmly in his grasp. You also called me a name, he recalls, and I blush. What was the name you gave me again? Physically, I wasn't hurt from the rusty nail that pierced my leg. My feelings were hurt because of V's reaction. 
I had started to cry, and he didn't make a move to help me. I was embarrassed and angry. I lashed out without thinking. After it happened, it was Avram who took me inside, cleaned me up and got me ready for Mog to take me to the emergency room once she got home. My voice breaks with my admission. I called you a monster. Yes, that's right. You believed I was a monster. I didn't really. I was a kid. So you don't believe this now? Shaking my head, I look down to where his hand continues holding me to him. No. Under my roof. He starts in a whisper, continuing to watch his fingers caress my skin. You've never been touched. No, not by anyone. I confirm again. Abruptly enlisting his iron resolve, V positions my foot to the floor, sits back in his chair, and grabs a new glass. With his eyes simmering in heat, he casts a downward glance at my body. I sit still on display in front of him. The cords of his neck and shoulders are tight, visibly tense. His nostrils flare, and his jaw squares when he brings his gaze back to mine and dismisses me with, Then you should go back to your room before I decide to change that. My heart stammers, losing its rhythm and pushing out against my chest. My breath quickens. My hands hold a desperate grasp to each side of my chair, where I sit frozen, unable to move. My lips ache in wonder of how his might taste. My breasts tighten, cresting to the point of pain. V, I whisper, please. A demonstrative growl breaks from his throat, interrupting my erotic thoughts. His eyes narrow with obvious limitation. Don't fucking beg me. He clips. You have no idea what you're begging me for. I just... Good night, Clara. Another voice intrudes the quiet interaction between us. Katrina stands near him, wearing only a pale gray silk robe. A cat-like smile dons her lips. I've been looking for you, sweetheart. She coos in his direction while ignoring me completely. Katrina Marks is a staple in Vlad's life, and one I've always hated. During the few years I've known her, she's been gawked at by Vlad's men, hated by most of the women, and never showed any care toward either. Katrina, Vlad bids, looking her up and down with the same hunger that had been directed at me. A slight pang of jealousy hits my chest, imagining the thrill of excitement she must get in touching him the way I know she's allowed. Curling her arm around his neck, she stands as close to his side as she can get and looks to me. It's late, she quietly notes, and the kids should be in bed. The same jealousy that previously stirred is being replaced with uncontested resentment, when I watch Vlad's eyes graze her chest and then trail lower. He studies her bare thighs before wrapping his arm around her waist, bringing the witch closer to his side. To your room, he directs, his voice low and menacing, keeping his eyes cast to her, not me. Doing as I'm told, but with a heavy heart filled with humiliation, I turn in place. Before making my way out, I stop, V inhales deeply, but doesn't look up. He appears as a caged animal, waiting for his freedom and willing to strike if it's granted. The picture of them together, her so experienced, him so ravenous with need, hitches my breath. I walk away at the same time, wondering how he could ever look at her the same as he'd been looking at me. 6. Vled has there been any word on when Vaina is due back? Abram queries, with Gleb standing attentively at his side. Yes, when I talked to her this morning, she told me she'd be home Friday. I don't express my concern over my sister's true whereabouts. She sounded flustered on the phone when I asked to speak to our uncle. She told me he was out and said she didn't have time to further explain. My uncle would never be out with family visiting from across the country, business or otherwise. All of this says my sister is lying. Looking down at the scattered stack of glossy pictures Gleb had taken in to get processed yesterday, 
I find exactly as I presumed I would. The trespasser holding the camera was no ordinary or innocent man. He wasn't standing outside the gate only to admire my home. When he was then so inspired, he felt compelled to photograph it. From all we have laid out in front of us, not only had he snapped a few the evening he was caught, but what looks to be several days before it. Reels and reels of photographs have been taken on different days, the hour varying, but the target of each photo all the same. Clara. Gleb moves in closer, picking up one off the top of the stack and asks, Do you want me to look in the Pileshi for this? It doesn't make sense that Pileshi would have any interest in Clara, Abram returns, picking another up for himself and admiring it attentively as he does. Suffice to say, I admire the one I'm holding as well. This one is of Clara sitting on the porch of my mansion with her bare legs stretched out in front of her. Her neck is tilted, setting her face toward the sun. Her eyes are closed as the palms of her hands hold her up, and in position to relax in its afternoon rays. The ends of her long blonde hair cascade down her back, brushing against the cement of our front porch. Her white shorts stand out in comparison to her long, sun-kissed legs. In this picture, she photographs as the captivating grown woman she is now not the rough and humble child I once thought her to be. With this image in mind, all thoughts move to what happened hours ago. As Clara rounded the corner to the kitchen, I found her unexplained presence arresting. The dim kitchen light softened her already delicate features, painting them with familiarity and forcing my focus steady. I ached to touch her soft skin. I wanted to taste her innocent lips. I thought how easy it would be to fracture the innocence she assured me was still there. She was receptive. Her face colored and her breathing labored as I spoke to her in a way she's most likely never heard before. The tension between us was exhilarating and new. With the aid of my drunken haze, my thoughts were provoked toward the feral need to feel a clean woman. To lie against such soft and fresh skin, thrusting myself into the warmth and purity only a woman of such little experience could grant. It's been a long time since I felt the heated demand of my own intellectual desires pushing toward the surface. And it was Clara who bribed them with her intelligence, her allure, her innocence. Taking her wouldn't compare to any others. Those thoughts alone incited feelings I wanted to keep buried, but couldn't. No doubt about it. The girl is beautiful, Abram declares quietly, breaking my stare from the top of my desk. With his eyes on me, he cocks a brow and prods. Isn't she, Vlad? The admiration he gives to the photo in his hand pricks at my skin with irrational annoyance as I continue to study the photo in mine. Nodding toward the others, Abram suggests, She could have an admirer. She walks your grounds every day, except most times Venny is with her. I've gone through most of these pictures at least once, Gleb states. There were no snapshots of Vanny, he adds, sorting through the pile. Only of Clara. If whoever took these had any interest in Vinyamin or even Katrina, they'd be in here somewhere. Katrina! Abram uncharacteristically snarls. Abram, I sternly address. Katrina means nothing to anyone. Leave it be. My closest friend's distaste for Katrina nearly matches Faina's. Abram tolerates the woman because she does her job, does it well, and typically doesn't cause a stir while doing it. Who is she? Abram abruptly questions with odd curiosity, 
taking a seat in Faina's favorite chair across from my desk. I ask, what do you mean? Then explain the obvious. She's a girl who's lived in my home for years. Not what I'm asking, he guides. Enzin Kosleyev had enemies, he puts in, tossing his picture on my desk. Once it lands, I grab it and add it to those I already have. We all have enemies, Abram, especially you. Expand your point. He does without delay. Before you had him killed, Clara's father made a deal with Peleshi and was preparing to help him take over one of our stables. That was over fifteen years ago. No amount of time would heal that deep a wound, Gleb sagely chimes, taking the seat next to Abram. Again, I don't follow. Who is Clara Kosliev? I mean, other than being one of your possessions, per se. Abram smiles, then finishes, Or a daughter of a long-since dead man. Who is she? A good question, and it's one I don't have an answer for. Once Enzin was killed, I wanted to forget any blood relation of his still existed. Clara became, as Abram fairly stated, a possession, a member of this house who, even though I didn't always care to acknowledge, was a member just the same. Because she lived under my roof, I protected her for the sake of Faina, then Veni. And because as she aged and my curiosity of her grew, I came to protect her from me as well. Unfortunately, I've realized the latter possibly for the first time just last night. Gleb answers as he gathers all the photos and prepares them to be put back in the manila envelope. Maybe Abram has a point of blood. Maybe Clara's more than just a dead man's daughter. Find out, I clip, directing my response at them both. Images of Clara being hunted by another man incites rage. The memory of last night, the things I said to her, what I felt in being so close to her enrages me more. Until then, I had never acted on the acknowledgement that Clara was a woman. More to the point, she was never a woman I thought to ever have. After she left Katrina and me alone in the kitchen, the visceral restraint I was barely grasping hold of snapped. Katrina once again served her purpose in taking my mind off my work, but last night something changed. It wasn't Katrina's body I touched, nor was it her face I saw or her voice I heard. When I closed my eyes, I was feeling Clara. Her voice whispered in my ear, begging for more and only stopping to moan with the satisfaction that only I was able to give her. Vled, Abram addresses, his tone heavy. What's on your mind? There are a few other alternatives, riskier alternatives, to finding out who may be linked to this. And what would those be? Killian Dawson. Abram replies with coolness. The Irishman may know something. The man Abram is asking about is a man much older than me. He runs a family close to the same size as mine, and he's been doing so for just as long. The Dawson's operation is centered directly between the Peleshi's operation and my own. It's told that even though the Irish display themselves is quiet, observant, and unchallenging to those who don't do business with them, Killian Dawson holds his enemies closer than I'd ever be comfortable in doing myself. As far as I am aware, neither he nor any member of his family has ever been so bold as to set a single step into my territory. They've never even asked permission to do this for any reason. They've always kept themselves. Gleb looks up, his eyes wide as if utterly appalled. You're suggesting Vlad go to Killian Dawson? For what, Abram? Advice? It was only a suggestion, Gleb. Abram gives a dramatic eye roll before his gaze falls to mine. 
So far, Killian or any member of the Dawson name has never been a threat to us. And as history tells us, the Irish aren't exactly allies to Chiro. It's possible he knows what Chiro's been up to these last few years. And more importantly, he may be willing to share. Share at what cost, Gleb reprimands. Turning to me, he pleads. This isn't a good idea. You've heard the rumors, I'm sure. Killian doesn't take kindly to those who speak with a foreign accent. You mean to say he doesn't take kindly to Russians, I clarify, amused at Gleb's sidestep of words, always so careful not to insult his own, namely me. Dawson doesn't trade in flesh or drugs, Gleb. He's only ever dealt in guns. We've never been a threat to his family's operations or livelihood. I aim to calm my high-strung guard. Abram has a point. Chiro is into everything. He is, Abram concurs. He's a greedy bastard, too. Gleb still doesn't agree. Killian's youngest son, Patrick, was married to Chiro's kid sister. Before they died, they had a child together. Liam Dawson is a twenty-five-year-old man now, not to mention he's also part Irish, part Italian. You can't tell me those two families aren't working together, not when they share blood. Years ago, I had heard what happened to Patrick and Gina Dawson. On the way home from a night out together, their car was struck by a drunk driver on the dark road. Gina and Patrick were pronounced dead at the scene. The driver lived, only to later die at Chiro's order. Liam, as I've come to understand, still lives with Chiro, and no longer has contact with Killian or anyone of the Dawson name. This could all be unfounded truth, but it's something that could work in my favor, nonetheless. The families aren't working together, Abram tells me calmly. Killian is a smart man who loves his grandson, and loved his son. Patrick Dawson has no ties to the family business, none. He worked their legitimate businesses, as did his wife, Gina. And what about Killian? Gleb clips. He's the oldest son and now the only. Technically, he's next in line. Then what better time than now to introduce ourselves formally to Killian? Getting in with his good graces could lead to getting into his oldest son's as well, Abram suggests. Turning to Gleb, I point out, the idea has merit. You're both wrong, Gleb accuses. Chiro didn't conveniently give his sister away to the Irish all those years ago without a plot or agenda. I've personally done the recon on this, and I've been thorough. Abram reassures. Chiro and Gillian don't speak, in personal matters or business. If anything, Gillian is livid that Chiro took Liam away. That makes sense, I state. No, that is insanity, Gleb utters. Neither of them should be trusted. Abram, rarely ever losing patience, turns his determined gaze to mine. Chiro's main source of income is drugs. Chiro is after Killian's lion's share in the black market gun trade. If he expands, he'll have added means in an attempt to overrun us. Gleb speaks his next piece with renewed calmness. I think this is a bad idea. Until we have a handle on this, I vote we let sleeping dogs lie. Approaching Killian could be considered an open threat to Chiro. Any family such as ours could be considered a threat to anyone, Abram charges. But if you want my opinion, I'd say contacting Dawson is worth the risk. If Chiro Pileshi is preparing for something with Clara, and he could tell us what it is, we should chance the risk. Agreed, I reply. Contact Killian's right hand. Feel him out. If the Irish are willing to talk, 
I'll call him and offer a meet. We'll go north and meet in the old temple square. This time Gleb doesn't object. He audibly gasps. Temple Square lines against Chiro's backyard, he exclaims. What are you hoping to accomplish by not only marching directly into his territory, but doing it to conspire against him? Standing, I take the pictures of Clara from his grasp, squaring them to a perfect pile before laying them next to the lamp that adorns my desk. Before directing my intent, I wait for both men to stand straight at attention. They need to hear this, to understand my reasoning. Their duty is to do as I say. However, the power of blatant honesty goes a long way when calling on a man to put his life on the line for the cause. Chiro Pileshi runs no more than a wounded circus. The men he has at his back aren't trained men. They're weak. If I'm going to bait Chiro into chasing me, I have to stand in his backyard, as you put it. You want him to come after you, Abram deduces with a small smile. You want Chiro to make the first move. Looking down to another picture of young Clara, this time holding a book in one hand and using the other to twist her hair, I nod in confirmation. If Chiro wants my territory to include anyone who lives inside it, I want him to admit what he's after, and not by sending some random idiot out to take pictures. Nodding to the pile of those on my desk, Gleb gives up and asks, What do you want me to do with those? Turning my gaze to the same, I state, Nothing. Let me know what Killian's contact has to say about my offer to meet. The sooner the better. Parting with a pensive look, Gleb bids a nodding, wordless goodbye before disappearing from my office. Abram, as I knew he would, still has things to say. With one arm across his chest, his opposite elbow resting on top of it, Abram uses his hand to hide his smirk. He fails miserably. This is funny to you. I start, pointing to the black chair and urging him to sit again. What did you find so amusing? Never bowing to my stern tone, he sits back in the chair and rests his arms on its edges. He kicks his ankle to his opposite knee and gets comfortable. I knew this day would come, he comments. God knows I've prayed for it. What day is that? Still smiling, he asks, You really have no idea. No, Abram, I don't. I prayed for the day you realized your true purpose. What are you talking about? Dropping his amused expression, he directs, When your father told me that I'd be coming to the States and that I'd be with you, I admit I had doubts. He and my father both. When he told me I was supposed to help you build what he expected from you, I admit I had more. My spine stiffens at his blatantly noted skepticism. I've always been doubted, but it never kept me from trying to prove myself. The longer I've been at this, the more effort it's taken for me to stand down and agree with all my father's orders. However, in challenging my father, I risk the consequences I'm sure he'd bury me under. Faina, Veni, even Clara and Mok would suffer those consequences the same. You think I'm going after Chiro to gain my father's respect? I'll assure you I'm not. You, of all people, know how I feel about Vori. He wasn't much of a father, Vled. I know this. Then tell me what you think you know. Why do you think I'm going after Chiro? Shaking his head slowly as if aiming to calm me. He states with sincerity, I think you're going after Chiro for reasons you obviously don't yet understand. And what reasons are those? Enlighten me, please, I prod, unfortunately curious. Pointing to the pictures on my desk, Abram voices carefully, One of your own is in harm's way. 
You don't like the possibility that Chiro, for whatever reason, has his eyes on the girl. Clara, I clarify, if only to myself. Clara, he repeats on a whisper, sitting back to get comfortable again. Yes, the girl. At his tone, I snap, enough. You're angry because you're looking at her in ways you never have before, and you don't know what to do with her. I assume no man under my roof would touch my property without permission. Enough, I clip again, this time louder and for the first time wishing I didn't allow Abram as much leash to speak his mind as I always have. And you're curious about her in ways you never wanted to be. I see it when you look at her. Abram, I swear to— She looks at you the same, he notes. She admires you. She always has. You came to this country when you were still a young man. You didn't bend to fit into your new world. You forced your new world to bend and fit to you. Shutting him down completely, I return. I'm angry because Chiro is an imbecile. He's a loose cannon with an agenda to serve himself. He's an idiot without an army. But if given the chance or opportunity, he'll surely build a new one. She's beautiful, Vlad, he says, ignoring all I've said. If I had a gun, I'd shoot you where you sit, I smart. While outright laughing, my friend further baits. Clara's really getting to you. I'm so glad I've lived to see this day. I could change that. Don't be an ass, he smirks. This is good. The part of me that's unavoidably curious questions, why now are you suddenly so interested in my relationship with the girl? The part of me that didn't want to know regrets asking when he returns. I don't think there's another woman on this earth you'll ever trust enough. Clara's been here, in this life, since hers began. She's loved by everyone, and has already been exposed to everything you are. She's young, I reject. I don't consider her anything more than that. You're either blind or you're trying to lie to me. I killed her family, I admit, through his incessant meddling, though he knows what I did. It's no secret, being that he was the one who followed through on my order. Clara's father was a yellow-bellied traitor. He was also an adulterous liar who repeatedly took his hand to his wife. He wasn't a good man, much less any kind of father. My own father raised his children as he would his soldiers, Abram. Even Faina lived under his combative thumb for years until she came here. I retort, again with something he already knows. But does that make Vori less my family? Any less my blood to avenge if someone were to kill him? The two instances don't compare. In your god's eyes, and in the eyes of Enzin's child, it should. Conceding to my point, Abram gives in, and I choose to not push further. I'm heading to Rashashi in a couple of days, I inform. I haven't been there in a while. Probably a good idea to check in, he comments. Want me to go with you? Shaking my head, I deny. No. I'll go alone. Katrina asked me to come see the progress she's made. If I need anything, I'll call. That woman has no interest in you checking out her progress, Vlad. The vulture wants you for herself. We're not discussing that. We're not, he agrees. I'm tired of trying to convince you. You don't listen anyway. A sudden and surprising movement crosses the door to my office so fast I nearly miss it. Abram turns his head where he sits, then brings his eyes back to mine. The ever-observant man misses nothing. We have company, he says long, using his hand once again to hide a smirk. Clara, I sigh. Exhausted by his efforts to rattle me. 
Come here. Peering her head around the corner, her eyes widen as she takes an Abram and me sitting at my desk. I'm sorry. I didn't know you were with... Hello, sweetheart, Abram states, cutting through her nervousness. Ignoring him, I raise my hand. Since my time alone with Clara this week, my discomfort with her has lessened. I don't want to re-examine the reasons why, least of all in front of Abram. I said come in. With a tray in her hands, Clara heads our way. A stainless steel pot as well as a single white cup is balanced with each and every step. Mock said you take your coffee this time every day. I told her I'd bring it on my way to go see Venny. Abram, uncharacteristically speechless, sits still. His eyes scan the tray before his focus moves to the back of Clara's head. She places the tray on the edge of my desk, where she begins to pour coffee in the cup. Her hands shake, leaving the steel to hit against the porcelain in small taps. Are you nervous? Abram surprisingly questions her directly. Clara's head stays lowered, but under her lashes her eyes shift to mine, and her face blushes. No, she utters. Then why are you so flustered? He pushes. Once she's finished with her task, she stands straight, wipes her hands on her thighs, and turns to Abram. I can't see her face, but he does, and he smiles. I deplore the bite of jealousy that strikes as I watch him take her in. Abram is religious, a married man with a young child of his own, yet he's reveling in the beauty of Clara as I've recently found myself doing, neither of us having the right. I'm fine, she excuses. Having no desire to continue watching Abram with Clara, I instruct, Tell Mock I'll take lunch in here today. Without offering me a response, she keeps hold of Abram's gaze. Once satisfied she's been dismissed, she takes two steps toward the door. Before she reaches it, I notice her steps are steady. Your foot is better, I comment, looking at her long legs beneath the white dress she's wearing. Clara turns in place, offers me a knowing glance before replying with a quiet and simple, Because of you. Thank you for that. She turns to walk through the door. Abram's eyes widen, his arms fall again to rest on the chair at the same time he clears his throat to pull my gaze from the empty office door. Seemingly no longer able to do as he's told and rein in his sarcasm. Abram curiously but forcefully questions, And you're telling me you've missed the fact that you find her as intriguing as you should? 7. Clara Oh, my lord in heaven! Mog shrieks in sudden horror as she stands frozen at the door of the kitchen. With her hand clutching her chest, she threatens, Veniamin Zaleski! Get out of there this instant, or I'll call your father in here to remove you. Mock's an older woman, but no one knows exactly how old. She refuses to share. She's completely gray, utterly wrinkled, and adoringly round. She's been employed by the Zaleskis since before I came to live with them. She acts as an exhausted stand-in grandmother to Venny, a never-listened-to fill-in mother to Faina and Vlad Zaleski's in-charge housemaid, at times also serving as the bane of his existence, or so I've heard him say. To me, she's just Monk, the woman I assist with the housework from time to time, but also a woman I've come to adore as much as I do the others. Monk's eyes come to mind where she rolls them with exasperation— Venny, whose body is bent low with his head buried deep into a bottom kitchen cupboard, had already told me he's in search of a box of goodies he'd stashed there weeks ago without Mock knowing. Hearing her enter, he turns in place and looks around the room for me. Then he smiles wide, always happy to get a rise out of Mock. Venny, why don't you go outside and find something else to do? Mock suggests now standing behind him, on guard in her kitchen as she always does. Don't you have some friends from school to hang out with? 
A girl? Anyone but me to pester? I'm sitting at the small kitchen work table, sorting the batch of cookies and cupcakes that have already cooled. We've spent the morning preparing boxes for a Brahms wife, Luciana, to pick up. She insisted Mock make her best so she could deliver them to a variety of businesses throughout the city, specifically those who care for the sick and poor. Then he stands straight and wipes his brow. I can't go hang with friends today. Dad's taking me shooting this afternoon. Mock's gray eyebrows knit together and she frowns. Shooting? Who are you shooting? Due to the questionable business this family is involved with, her question stands to reason. With a huge smirk, then he shakes his head and assures, We're not shooting people, Mock. Sheesh. At least not today, she murmurs. Then he doesn't miss her reaction and moves in to inform, Dad's taking me back to the open range for more practice. Turning to me, Mock sighs, this one heavier than the last. She mumbles to herself about children needing to be children, and that being 16, Venny shouldn't have to be learning the ways of becoming a man in this family. The problem is Venny has been learning what it means to be in this family for years. Clara! Venny calls, walking toward me. He snags a cookie from the box I just finished packing, then takes a seat in the chair across from mine. Before taking a bite, he asks, You want me to see if you can come with us today? Dad could teach you how to shoot. I don't think, woman, you're going to be 21 and you still don't know how to protect yourself. He notes, protect myself from what? Venny's face grows hard. You know what I'm talking about. Ignoring the obvious what we both know is true, I reply. I have you to protect me, Venny. He's either flattered or dismissing my half-truth. Venny would protect me if he could and at all personal cost. I just hope he's never given the chance. I have work here. I'll be around when you get back. You can teach me another time. Snatching the uneaten cookie from his hand, I start to lay it back in the box where it came from. My arm is caught. Venny's eyes widen, as do mine, before they move to the large tattooed hand covering my wrist as Venny looks up to the man holding it tightly in his grasp. When he swallows hard, I follow suit. You made this? V's dark voice breaks from where he stands above me. The skin of my wrist ignites at his touch. My heart beats fast, recognizing how close he's standing. My chest moves up and down for each shallow breath I'm fighting to take. Images come fast and hard of us together. His hand on my leg, his fingers beneath my thigh. His words, crass but inviting. I can't breathe. Using the hand not holding my wrist, V grabs the cookie from between my fingers. I follow the trail as he takes it to his lips. With a calculated smirk, V's mouth opens and he takes a bite. Residual crumbs coat his moist lips. I can't tear my eyes from him. I should. By all rights, my concentrated stare could be considered a challenge. V chews, takes another bite, and then puts the remainder of the cookie to my mouth. When my nerves keep me from responding, he uses the edge of it to prod my lips apart, where he silently and gently suggests I bite. Venny, not too young to understand the intimacy of his father's actions, turns his back to us and addresses Mock. Doesn't matter how old I am, little Miss Mock's cookies will always be the best, he states for distraction. Still smirking, V ignores his son and continues to drill his stare into mine, harder and deeper than before. Oh, so you say. Mock brushes off, paying no mind to what's happening at the table. Mock's cookies are very good. V returns, agreeing with his son. Finally, I'm offered a reprieve as he frees my wrist and brings his attention to Venny. Are you ready to go, or are you happy helping the women in the kitchen? Get your boy out of here, Vlad. He's been nothing but a pain in my behind. Mock urges. Clara and I work much faster without all you young men in the way. Is that so? V asks, looking down on me with his eyebrows raised in silent inquiry. Tilting his head to the side, he questions only me. Do you work better without men? I feel the blood rushing to my cheeks, more fast and furious recollections of standing close to him in the kitchen the night before strike. 
He interrogated me about who had possibly touched me, and with my assurances, he already knows no man ever has. Then he assaulted me with a feeling of being wanted by a man as vastly powerful as he is. Now he's unfairly using this knowledge to his advantage. Shoo now! Mog nags, breaking V's concentrated gaze. A part of me, one not small and not buried deep, resents her interruption. The same as I resented Katrina's the night V not only cared for my foot, but gave away part of himself in conversation in a way he never had before. Take that son of yours and keep him out of here until we're finished. Luciana will be by in a few hours for pickup. All while Mog continues her rant, then he grabs his bag and shoes to prepare to leave. V's determined gaze may have shifted from mine, but only temporarily. Bending at the waist, he lowers his mouth close to my ear. My hair is up, giving him unobstructed access. His warm breath cascades down my neck first, before he inhales deeply. An indistinct but now familiar growl comes next. Then he observes, Glara, you're blushing again. I'm not, I whisper smartly while studying the table. You are, he accuses, and I've hardly touched you. Concentrating on the array of boxes, tape, and all we baked, I struggle to hold my composure. After he's taken a step back, I notice he's right. I'm burning from the inside out. You've thought about how my hands would feel on you, he whispers. Did you think of me when... My eyes slam shut, clearing the way for another visual assault, this one vivid and in color. Breathless and flustered, I gasp as if I've run a mile. Dad! Venny shouts, saving me from having to answer. Tensing, I move my head to the side, leaving V still close. Venny's face is angry. I think Dad's happy to help the women in the kitchen. Venny swarts to Mog, assuring his father can hear. As V stands straight, I release a breath. The smell of his skin, woodsy and rugged, quickly fades, as well as his devilish grin. No, Venny, I'm not. His hoarse voice replies as he keeps his eyes on mine. Let's go. 8. Vlad I just walked in, Abram. I'll call you when I'm finished with the briefing, I tell him, entering the double doors of Russia Shi. The foyer appears the same as it always does. The lights shine brightly against the gray and black ceramic bar stretched out along the far wall. The line of oversized and comfortable bar stools is filled with several male members who I know have already been approved. Some are dressed in business attire, likely now getting off work from their mundane jobs and not wanting to go home to their boring wives and screaming children just yet. Others are dressed down and casual, not caring to take time to impress anyone in particular. My sweet but feisty bartender, Lane, is rushing around behind the mirrored bar, preparing drinks the waitresses have ordered. Her cheeks are flushed with exhaustion, and her long straight dark hair is pulled back into a low ponytail. Boss, she greets, pouring a tap beer and expertly tilting the glass beneath it. Katrina's been out on the floor a few times looking for you. She says you're late. With no surprise in hearing of Katrina's annoyance, I question, where is she? Len hesitates and nods to the closed steel double doors on the side wall. The room she's gesturing to is reserved for new member introductions. They want a place in private to discuss the terms of the contract they're required to sign. Most don't argue with these terms, as the benefits they receive are of the carnal variety. Who is Katrina with? Looking away, Lane quietly utters, Thomas Edders. The name causes the hair on the back of my neck to rise. Thomas is a man for whom I refused to approve membership. When Abram checked his references, they weren't clean, and his background as a prior low-level pimp wasn't one I wanted associated with my business. Something's not right. 
Katrina called Eve out and escorted her in there with them. Eve, one of my youngest girls with the least experience behind her. For whatever reason, Katrina has been hardest on her in the past. Sir, really? Elaine addresses tightly. I tried to call you. I didn't have a good feeling. I'll check it out. Thank you, Elaine. My concern grows greater as I make my way across the room, shifting through the crowds of guests and opulent furniture. The door I've aimed for isn't locked, and it opens without effort. The guard standing outside nods in acknowledgement to my unspoken demand to stay close. Once I'm nearly inside the dark room, I freeze. My blood ignites as the light behind me casts a glow over what's taking place. The stench of sweat, sex, and the sound of female cries assault. Looking around the room, I find Katrina standing against the far wall with her arms crossed over her ample chest. She's dressed in a short black dress in high heels as she smirks while taking in the scene in front of her. Eve's eyes are covered in a black blindfold. Her blonde hair tangles against the pillow when she thrashes her head from side to side in search of whoever she fears has entered. What the fuck? Thomas's narrowed eyes turn from his attention to Eve. The large, dark-haired, bare-chested predator has his jeans draped around his ankles as the young girl in front of him cries out. She's alone. She's young. She's innocent. When he pulls himself from inside her, a deep red mist coats my vision, matching the fury stewing inside. Sensing my reaction, Katrina stands straight from her place against the wall. Running to me in a flurry, she calculates what I'm about to do and fervently demands, Vlad, wait! Thomas removes his hands from Eve and immediately adjusts to cover himself. Eve cries out again. The red marks on her inner thighs radiate like a beacon in the light coming in from the door. Thomas's eyes turn from venomous to panic. When Katrina's hand hits my chest to stop me from killing Thomas myself, I grab her wrist and squeeze without mercy. Without having to ask a single question, I raise my other hand and strike her hard with the back of it. Katrina doesn't fall far due to my grasp. I hold her up and she turns back to me, her eyes wide and full of confusion. Holding her cheek and caressing the mark I've made to it, she whimpers, This was his welcoming into the club. I thought... Another strike to her face causes her head to fall the opposite way. Thomas attempts to quickly pass me on his way to the door, as if I'll let him out of this so easy. With my voice echoing off the black-painted walls, I call to the guard standing outside the door. Throwing Katrina to the floor in a fit of rage, I look toward the man in Rachershi uniform and order, Take him away. He's banned from ever stepping foot inside again. The guard curtly nods stepping into the room with another at his side. Together the men carry a fighting Thomas away as he pleads his innocence. Katrina said it was okay, he tries. She said Clara asked for me. Clara. Images of a woman who looks not unlike the one crying in pain and fear plague my senses. The woman tied to the bed across the room looks vastly similar to the innocent one I left at home. Brand him, I add to my order, my tolerance reaching its end. Then let him go. Though Thomas contests that forcing a crying woman is of no fault of his own, he's a monster. Now he'll physically be marked as one who crossed my path. Vlad, wait! Katrina voices again, garnering my attention. I did this for you. For me. My anger rises further. Clara's just a girl, but I saw the way you looked at her. You wanted her. I thought... No, Katrina. 
and if I wanted her, I would have been fucking her instead of you. Another guard comes to the door. I take a look around at what was done as one of Katrina's women who oversees the others unties Eve. Her wrists are bruised, and her legs are shaky as she stands. Her eyes move to mine. In them, only sadness and despair are left. This, I pause and point for emphasis. Leaning down, I grab Katrina by the hair to ensure I have her attention. I position her to face Eve and finish. Isn't how we treat the women we employ. She's paid to do what I tell her, Katrina combats. Exhausted by her defiance and temperament, I bend at the waist and wrap my hands around her slender throat. As I pick her up, she attempts to swallow, but it comes out as a gasp for life. Her fingernails score the skin of my hand as she aimlessly tries to free herself. Throwing her back against the closest wall, Katrina's head snaps in place. Eve shrieks at the sound, the only reason I don't continue my assault. When I set Katrina free, her feet drop to the floor. Her eyes come to mine with malice. Grabbing her arm, I pull her to me again while looking at the guard near my side and instructing, Whip her. Don't let her forget what she's done. Katrina's intolerance to my order gets the best of her and she stupidly murmurs, You and the little one deserve each other. I haven't ordered you to be branded and banished, Katrina, although I fucking should. What happened here was dirty even for you. Turning her toward the guard, I grab her hair and push her into his arms. Her body slams against the wall of his chest. Now get her out of my sight before I beat her myself. 9. Vlad We're set. Killian Dawson is willing to talk. From what his man Eli said, he's eager for your call. Abram concludes after filling me in on everything he's procured in the way of Killian Dawson. He also gave his word to keep the call and the meat out of Peleshi's ear. Do you believe this? I do, Abram assures without having to deliberate. And I would like to ask just one thing, Vled. Looking up from my desk, I question, and that is? With Vori due in soon. Go in easy with this. For all of us, I'd like your father's visit to go well. You worry too much, Abram. None of what we're doing will have any effect on my father's visit. His eyebrows draw up, and he points to the pictures on my desk. I worry too much. I take that the job is my own because you don't. That man... We don't have any idea who that man was. Perhaps we should work to find this out soon, yes? Nodding, Abram attempts to shelve his smirk. Perhaps you're more in control than I've given you credit for. Perhaps you're right, I reply. He's not. My control has been tested more this week than the entire year prior. When I arrived home from the gruesome stupidity of one of my most successful managers, I walked into the house where I found Ruan and Clara playing cards with Alina in the living room. Clara was freely laughing. That is until she saw me standing at the door watching. Once she stopped, I wished she'd have continued. I was happy to find her still innocent and unharmed. My sense of relief was puzzling. I'll call you later, Abram bids. Nodding back, I return. I'll be here. Picking up the phone, I dial and wait. The smiling face of Clara lures my mind to furious thought. If someone is looking for her, looking to take what's mine, what's been mine since my family informally claimed her as a child, they'll be stopped the likes of never taking another free breath again. If you're calling on this line, I presume you're someone I should talk to. Killian lightheartedly greets. And if you're calling at this hour, 
I assume it's important. Checking my watch, I note it's nearly nine at night. I've disturbed him. To sway his agitation, I offer a complimentary greeting. So, the great Killian Dawson is in fact real, not just the legend I've heard about all these years. Laughing quietly, the man waits a second before returning, and the rumors of ruthlessness in the Russians are apparently folklore. I hadn't expected to find humor in your tone. Immediately at ease, I sit back in my chair and waste no time in getting down to business. I'm guessing Abram brought you up to speed for why I'm calling. He spoke to my adviser, yes. I'll admit I was surprised to hear Chiro is up to no good, he states. I witnessed what you did to him all those years ago. Fifteen years, I put in for fact. And he had that coming. He did, he affirms. If all I heard was true, conspiring to turn your own man against you, he had that coming, but much more. You went easy on him. Looking back, I probably did. I'd have been young, less experienced, more tolerant. And in case you weren't aware, now the vile fool has lured himself to work in solely within the undergrounds of the city, Killian informs. Meaning Chiro's run himself down to the low of lone sharks, the scum of undignified and uneducated pimps, and inexperienced assassins. Chiro should do well there, providing he could survive them as weak as he's been rumored of being. If it's not too much to ask, Killian, can I arrange a visit with you, face to face? Surely you're not coming here. He tisks. I'm coming there. I nod, even knowing he can't see. Easier for you, closer to home. As for me, I'd like to see for myself how much neutral territory Chiro has taken advantage to. You're bolder than I'd given you credit for. He jests. I don't know if that makes you foolish, stubborn, or brilliant. Maybe some of each, I reply, taking no offense to his blatant opinion. I'll have Abram get word to you when I can get the time away from here. Unfortunately, considering what's happening, that time may be sooner than later. You're having trouble, he presumes. We'll see. If Chiro is playing me, he's doing a good job of it. Yes. Eli mentioned a man had been taking pictures. I wouldn't have expected Chiro to act out so passively. But nothing he does has ever surprised me. If Chiro is stupid enough to flaunt himself directly outside my gates, I plan to flaunt back near his. Killian states, Then we'll talk soon. Just us. Just us. I strongly concur. Take care. Just as I sit up to place the phone on its cradle, Clara's young face vies for my attention. Picking up the photograph, I hold it in my hand, framing it there while narrowing my eyes. Before I'm able to take a few minutes for myself, Faina opens the door to my study. Well, good to see you, Vled. Faina, I greet with a relieved smile. You're back from New York. Stretching her arms wide, she turns in a circle and smarts, In all my brilliance. It's good to see you safely where you should be. Her eyebrows furrow. Something's up. I felt it when I got here. What's happened? Not your worry, I tell her. Tilting my head to the side in thought, I note Faina looks different. Happy, even. My sister has always lived her life as close to the edge as I allow. The idea that she's walking even closer to it unsteadies my nerves. Why are you looking at me like that? She accuses. Where have you been? Puzzled, she asks, Where have I been? You know where I've been. 
I don't, I remark. I know you were in New York, but not once did you return my calls until I made more calls and tracked you down. So tell me, where have you been? Laughing, she drops a bag on my desk, yet carefully avoids extending an answer. These are for you. Uncle said it was time you had one of the finest. Pulling the bag toward me, I find a box of cigars, Cuban and expensive. I'll call him later to tell him thanks. That be good, she answers, taking a seat across from me and staring with open curiosity. He's impressed with you. He said he'll tell Vori that when he sees him soon. You bragged about me, I see. Smiling, she replies, always. The better graces you are in with the family, the better I am too. Her passive statement coincides with the wonder I have for her unusually happy disposition. My sister is hiding something. How's my Venny? she asks, deflecting my stare. He's good. Clara? she questions, eyebrows raised and voice poised to strike. I didn't banish her to her room while you were away, if that's what you're insinuating. I wasn't insinuating anything. She shakes her head. The trust and friendship between Clara and Faina has always been strong. Yet as Clara's grown, the bond between them has become nearly impenetrable. Those in this family hold loyalty to each other, but false loyalty can be given if the last names differ in any way. I don't imagine the two women acknowledge the difference. I have business, I tell her. Venny's been asking when you'd be back. You should go find him. I have lots of gifts for him, and Clara, too. I'm sure of it, I dig. You should go make sure they get them. Standing, she sighs. I will. But first I've got one small request. Yes? Well, a couple, actually. I roll my eyes as she often does. She hates when I mimic her, but I hate when she puts in requests. They're never small. The favors are in regards to Clara. I frown. What is it this time? I'm moving her room, she explains first. She's not a paid employee, Vlad. She may have been raised a guest here, as you've always put it, but she's not a member of your staff. She shouldn't be sleeping next to them. Knowing Faina will argue to the death if I don't, I concede. Fair. Move her room. Really? Really, move her. Taking in a breath, she continues. For her birthday, I'm buying her some new clothes, too. She's always wearing threads or the clothes I've given her. Not my business. Leaning forward, Faina presses. I mean a lot of new clothes. As in the same kind I wear. The expensive kind. Their clothes, Faina. My God, I wasn't aware there were so many clothes to choose from to wear. Satisfied she gets to shop, Faina asks, Will you be going to Clara's get-together tomorrow night? Her get-together? Faina, I've seen the guest list. I imagine this get-together is more of an extravagant event than anything. Raising her brows, she presses, Are you going to at least make an appearance? Yes, I see no reason why I shouldn't. Are you not feeling well? Faina worries. Are you sick? I shake my head, not understanding. What? I practiced an entire speech on the way home. I thought you'd... Cutting her off, I state, Faina, I don't care what you do with the girl. You need a new project, then so be it. Use her. You're not going to say anything to upset her or make her feel like less because of what I'm doing. No. You have my word. So I can do anything with her? Christ. Handing over free reign to Faina in regards to Clara could be dangerous. Giving in, only to get her out of my office, I reply, My word has been given. 
I really do have something I need to do. Is there anything else? Yes, actually. I've given something else some thought. Continue, but get it out, I push. Ruan isn't married, and as far as I know, he's not seeing anyone, she decrees. Maybe he'd like to take Clara. No fucking way will that happen, I command. The image of Clara holding my injured hand with care flashes before my eyes, making me uneasy. Her innocence, her hidden strength, and her resiliency offer little reprieve from the memory of the time we shared during Faina's absence. No other man, especially one I know, deserves the same attention. We're finished here, I tell her as I stand. Move Clara. Dress her up in whatever you feel she needs, but that's it. No matchmaking. When I look up, my sister's expression is puzzled. You called her Clara, she accuses. That's her name, isn't it? You don't call her by her name. To avoid her condescending tone and whatever else she may say, I clip, Faina, I have missed you, but get out. I have things to do. Once again annoyed, Faina's hands move to her hips. You're impossible. Impossibly busy. Now go. It's late. Find Venny, say hi, and then he goes to bed. 10. Vlad. Stop complaining, Abram barks, hearing Gleb moan once again that the tie Faina forced him to wear fits like a noose. You look civilized. Funny, because I think I look more like a duck, he whines. It's penguin, you goon, Abram corrects with a smile, running his hand down his chest to check that his own tie is in place. Go get yourself another drink. It'll help you forget about the suit. Gleb shakes his head in disbelief, but does as suggested and steps away without a word. When I gave Faina permission to throw a party for the girl, I didn't mean this. What? Abram mocks with failing innocence. This is nothing more than a quaint little get-together. This is a monstrosity. The place looks as bad as prom night at the local high school. Chandeliers hang from the ceiling. The dance floor is centered in the room. Candelabras are lit, scattered throughout near tall painted walls. Waiters walk around holding trays of champagne and hors d'oeuvres. Faina has clearly outdone herself this time. Ruan mentioned Police Chief O'Donnell was by earlier to tell Clara happy birthday, Abram notes. Wonderful. Just what we need. To be seen having drinks with the local P.D., Clara likes Garrett, Vlad, and cut Faina a break while you're at it. It was a smart move to ask him to come. No, it was a stupid and unnecessary move. Now all we need is for Congressman Green to show his face here, too. He did, Abram enlightens. He just left. Turning only my head, I insist, you're joking. Smiling, Abram admits, I am. But you should see the look on your face right now. You know I hate jokes. And you know you're an easy target. Brushing off Abram's attempt to bait me, I lift the rim of my glass to my lips. My hand stops mid-motion, and my eyes lock on none other than the birthday girl herself. She's in the middle of the floor, dancing with Ruan. She's smiling up at him as if he's the only person in the room. As if I hear a trigger click into place, a possessive red line coats my vision at his hands touching her, even in her most innocent of places. My hands clench as his chest brushes against hers. Clara's hair is up, leaving her long neck exposed. Small locks of her blonde strands hang down to kiss her bare shoulders. I see from here that her fingernails are painted black. On anyone else I'd consider the color ridiculous, but dressed in a black silk and lace dress, she looks all the more put together. 
Ruan is dressed in a black suit, black tie included. His hair had to have taken an hour to perfect. Like this, he looks older, more experienced, and he also looks completely satisfied with himself. You see what I see? Abram leans over and nudges my shoulder. Don't you? Yes, I see it clearly. I couldn't turn away from the sight of her even if I were able. I don't voice this, but instead answer, Yes, Ruan and Clara are dancing. If that's all you see, then you're more inexperienced with women of class than I originally thought. He scoffs, then sternly instructs, Ask her to dance, Vlad. No, I quickly deny. She's content with Ruan. Let them be. Abram deliberately sighs. Yes, she definitely looks content. It isn't until Ruan's hands drop just below Clara's waist and he pulls her closer to him than I'm comfortable with that Abram clears his throat. As I turn to look at my meddling friend, I find he's studying my reaction carefully. Vled, I love you like a brother, but for fuck's sake, don't let another man take what you want out from under you. You'll regret it. He's right. I know he is. I do want her. And in a way, I shouldn't. Clara, being so young and inexperienced, would want more. Me, being as I am, could never afford to give her what she would unquestionably demand. Leave her be. You're a coward. I'm not a coward, I refute. Clara scares the hell out of you, admit it. There's not a woman alive who scares the hell out of me, Abram. Stop it. Okay, you're right. I'll stop. Thank you. Ruan would be good for Clara, he casually states. The two would make beautiful babies together. Ruan's Russian, right? He continues to successfully goad. Deciding to do something I've never done, pursue a woman. Even for a dance, I turn to my friend. I'll be back. On my way to Clara, another of Abram's laughs breaks out along with his utterance of Don't hurt him, friend. Ruan is one of our best. Clara. Happy birthday. Vlad bends to whisper as I stand in Ruan's arms. Ruan looks down on me and smiles so big, his cheeks dimple on each side. He nods to Vlad, pales at the sight, and then instantly releases me to take a step back. Boss, he finally greets. Ruan, V curtly addresses, lifting his chin to the crowd. V directs, you have other admirers. Go see to them. All of us turn to three young women, teenagers of those who work for V, standing in a line against the wall. All of them look at Ruan as they whisper giddily to each other. Since I think I just lost my dance partner, I should probably head off to find another one. Yes, you should. Vlad's hand takes mine. At the same time, he brings his massive frame to stand in front of me, blocking my view of Ruan's hasty getaway. Then he moves his large hands, grasping my waist. You didn't have to be so abrupt, I comment, shaking my head in disbelief. Ruan and I were almost finished. Not soon enough, he counters, his eyes darken as he glares down into mine. He's jealous. I'm intruding on your evening, he surmises when I've said nothing. If you'd rather I... No, I immediately object. Maybe you just didn't need to barge in until we were finished. Vlad says nothing in defense. I'm being mean. I've scolded him for only wanting to dance. Surprised by his lack of anger, I start to admit, I just didn't think you I'd dance, Clara, he assures. Even monsters are capable of swaying back and forth to music. The smell of his cologne drifts between us as I bring my gaze to his broad chest. He's not wearing a tie like his men are. The top two buttons of his pressed white shirt are undone, exposing the thick cords of his neck. Put your arms around me, 
he insists. I promise not to bite if that's what has you staring at me the way you are. Feeling small, I do as he says, wondering if it's true that he doesn't bite. Yet, I also wonder how that bite may feel should he break that promise. When I shiver at the image, V pulls me closer. My hand rests against his shoulder, and as I look over it, I find Abram standing near the entrance. He's watching us together carefully, smiling as if in triumph. Are you having any fun? He asks quietly. Or were you before I barged in? I nod, keeping my eyes locked to Abram for false security. He's talking to Faina now. As her focus turns to V and me, she shakes her head as her eyes widen in disbelief. You're giving me a complex. Are you going to say anything at all? Bringing myself back to us together on a dance floor, I pull my head up and take my first genuine look at him. All others in the room have faded away. No more noise heard through the static of my confusion, only V smiling down on me, seemingly daring me to speak. You could say something nice, I tell him, boldly pushing the dare back to his corner. Nice? All the others I've danced with so far have said something nice. I explain the challenge, and you rarely have anything to say at all. Rarely? As in never. I see. He contemplates, then quiets. Thank you for giving me this. I note, watching as surprise rises in his eyes. I didn't need a party, but turning twenty-one only happens once. Presumably more comfortable, V's hand travels low against my back, finding the dip of the dress Faina insisted I wear. Looking down at me with eyes fueled with fire, V's chest grazes mine when he takes in a startled breath. The warmth of his fingertips spreads against my bare skin, sending shivers and shock up my spine, and leaving a line of heat once he moves them away. Christ, Clara, he hisses and I frown. You could tempt the heart of a saint in that dress. Annoyed at his tone, I don't think before I react. Good that I'm not dancing with a saint. A cruel smile crosses his lips, one full of mystery and intrigue. Careful, beautiful girl. Your talons are sharp. From feeling annoyed to now angry, I hold his gaze with my own, Narrowing my eyes, I move to shock him just as he's done to me. Remember the scar? The one on my leg? Yes, he answers, positioning his hands firmly around my waist and locking them together at my back. You said I didn't listen to you and that's why I got hurt. That's right. I told you to stay in the house and you didn't. I called you a monster. Rolling his eyes in agitation, he sighs. We need to discuss this again? When it happened, I was mad because you never asked me why I disobeyed you. His eyebrows furrow, and he opens his mouth to say something, then stops. Not giving him a chance to stop me from saying more, I add. I came outside because I was afraid to be in the house alone. Afraid? Faina had been out all day with Benny. But Leonid was there. Gleb was inside, too he insists, but you weren't, I counter, then continue telling him what I know he couldn't have ever known. I went to find you. I wanted to be wherever you were. Clara, he starts, but I don't let him finish. You don't believe me, I infer, but you should because it's true. I called you a monster not because I was in pain, but because I was angry you weren't paying attention to me. I don't know what to say to that, he replies, you never paid attention to me. That's not true, he counters. Isn't it? You always... From behind him, intrusive and loud female voices call his name, overlapping one another as they get closer. We turn our heads in time to see Katrina breaking through the crowd, Faina snapping closely at her heels. She came for you, I solemnly state what he already knows. You should talk to her outside. Faina won't like her here. With guilt covering his face, V releases his hold. The loss of his body against mine is greatly noticed. She wasn't supposed to be here, he tells me. She's here now, so you should go. Before Katrina has a chance to arrive, V turns to me, grabs my elbow, 
kisses my cheek, and with a voice soft, genuine, and certain, he says, For what it's worth, I'm paying attention to you now. Happy birthday, my beautiful girl. Too late for him to hear me, as his back is turned and his ear close to Katrina's mouth, I don't get the chance to explain that for him to call me his was the nicest compliment anyone could have given me tonight. 11. Clara After getting home late and helping Faina put an extremely tipsy mug to bed, I said goodnight to Venny. Now, as I stumble my way through the house, I'm cursing myself for drinking as much as I did. After V followed Katrina outside and never returned, my enthusiasm for the evening notably passed. For the first time in my adult life, I craved a drink, or six. Ruan stayed behind and offered to dance in V's place. He didn't have to explain that he was there because he saw my reaction. Obviously, my disappointment was written all over my face. When I refused to ruin his night and chose to keep drinking instead, he insisted on not leaving my side. I've only really consumed alcohol in the past on New Year's Eve, and that's always only been one glass for celebration, maybe two. I'm realizing too late that the five or six I indulged in tonight may not have been so well thought out. The room is spinning, and when I look up at the ceiling... The light bulbs are blurry. I'm also extremely thirsty. Shit, I curse, grazing my wrist on a sharp corner of the hallway table. Thankful the way is lit, I pass my room and head down the hall toward the kitchen. The fluorescent lights Muck is always insisting she have in her workspace all shine brightly. When I round the kitchen's corner, I'm immediately stopped from moving forward. In a high-back wooden chair... Katrina is straddling V's lap. Her hands grasp its spindles, and her naked legs hang loosely at each side. Her feet barely touch the floor. Her body is grinding into his, hip to hip, torso to torso. Her eyes are closed, and her head is thrown back. My gasp of surprise brings her focus to mine. A burning trail of unwarranted jealousy and anger heats my blood, bringing it to a boil. V had been genuinely attentive tonight. He danced with me, held me close. When he touched me, I know he felt it. More to the point, I know I did. He'd listened to me rattle on about a memory I had of him as a child, spilling it out like a confession. As I pull myself from tonight's fog, I watch Katrina's mouth as it forms a devilish smirk. Her fingernails dig into V's shoulder and back as she keeps her sadistic gaze locked to mine. V continues lifting her body in the air before pulling her back down on top of his. His throttled movements are rough and uncaring. She winces when his mouth finds her neck. He must have bitten down. I can't see his face, but when she pulls away from him, the mark he left is clear. The mark he left on her. It isn't until V releases an ominous growl, followed by her yelp of surprise, that I realize I've been watching them together for far too long. My palms sweat and my thighs quiver. My heartbeat throbs at the base of my throat. My mouth waters, not from the picture of them together, but only V alone. His broad shoulders protest under her weight as he seamlessly positions her where he wants her to be. The back of his neck reddens against her touch. A guttural moan strikes each time he brings her back down onto him. I can't watch this. As I start to turn away, Katrina smiles again, then bends to whisper in his ear. My name, along with child, is clearly heard. V stops moving, his body becoming tense. When he stands, he takes her with him. Though his shirt has been discarded, his camouflaged cargo pants are in place, but unbuttoned. He sets her to her feet, turns her, and pushes on her back to force her chest to the table. Holding the back of her neck, V locks her body in place as he thrusts into her with force. He locks his gaze to mine even as she whimpers beneath him and struggles to get free. I don't recognize this man anymore. There is no kindness in his eyes, no care in his touch, no longing when he looks at me, no heat, passion, desire, or excitement. This is the brutality of a powerful man carnally fucking a faceless but willing woman. No more, no less. Defeat consumes me, 
It was better to have watched Katrina's reaction to V rather than his own reaction. Turning around, I start to walk away. I feel his eyes on me as I take one step, then another. Before I'm any farther down the hall, I hear him utter something in the most abhorrent of ways. V calling my name as he finishes himself inside her. 12. Vlad You said Clara, Katrina hisses, moving to stand. That stupid girl's name. My jaw ticks, and I don't satisfy her with a response. After the setup I walked in on with her and Thomas Edders, my anger at her hasn't diminished at all. She was here tonight to serve one purpose, and now she realizes what that purpose was. Business or not, Clara or not, this relationship is about to be severed. Katrina bends to gather her shirt off the kitchen floor. The one I'd torn when my anger, outrage, and annoyance had been tested too far. I wanted to slap her, beat her, for interrupting Clara's party as she did. Instead, because I'm well versed with Katrina's feelings for me, I decided to use them against her and give her what she thought she wanted. Slipping on her shirt and then running her hands toward the back of her neck, she pulls her hair out before snapping the front shut. When Katrina interrupted my time with Clara, a time which I was enjoying, she told me there was a problem at her stable. Once Abram and I checked into it, we found there was nothing that couldn't have waited until the party was over, or until the next morning. Sated but pissed, I dismiss Katrina with, however you got into my home at this hour, see that you don't do it again. Fuck you, she spits. Her eyes narrow again as they move up my throat, then to my angry stare. She's nothing, she accuses, standing on her toes and gaining inches toward my face. She's a no one from nowhere. My patience snaps. The sharp echo of the back of my hand striking her face fills the space between us. Katrina falls to the floor, holding her cheek and looking back at me with a venomous expression. A sadistic laugh bursts from her chest, followed by a sharp inhale of breath before she bites, Do you really think a woman like her could please a man like you? Get out. She wouldn't last a night in your bed, Vlad. We both know it. You won't come back. Her expression changes, not to remorse for what she's accused, but to regret for what I've told her. You don't mean that, she protests, daring to stand in front of me. When she brings her hands to rest against my bare chest, her fingertips burn the skin like acid. Grabbing her wrists, I squeeze them both until I see pain flush in her eyes. Abram will settle whatever money you're owed. Leonid will pack your things from the stable. You're finished, Katrina. I don't ever want to see your face again. Stupidly, she doesn't take to my instruction. Instead, she collects herself and sneers, what would Vori say if I told him you preferred a child like her to a woman like me? Gripping her wrists harder, I shake her. Her head jerks wildly back and forth before I stop. Laughing again, she adds, I wonder what Clara would look like dressed up like all the other little whores you have at your back call and payroll. Just you, Katrina. You're the only honest-to-God whore I've ever known. Scowling, she steps forward. And that's how it will stay. Vori will know if you so much as... Her unfinished threat is the final yank to my already frayed strand of patience. Clutching her neck tightly, I effortlessly position her body against the nearest wall. Her head slams against it, and her hanging feet kick out against my legs. As she digs her fingernails into my wrist, I strengthen my grasp. If you say her name, if you speak to her, if you so much as think of ever getting close to her again, I'll cut out your tongue and feed it to the dogs. Do you understand?
her body bucks continuing its weakening fight against my power. Using all of my strength, I push against her, leaning in close to whisper in her ear. After Meridius finishes with your tongue, I'll spear your eyes and cut off your nose to feed Maximus. Then I'll kill you, banishing you to the gates of hell where you belong. I release her, and Katrina falls to the floor, clutching her neck and gasping for breath. She doesn't say another word, nor does she challenge to look at me again. She turns on her heels to run through the door, hopefully never to be heard from again. Clara. Furious tears roll down my cheeks. The wetness of my humiliation continues to linger against my pillow. When I left the kitchen so quickly, Meridius followed me back to my room. He's been a silent comfort with every lick to my face and nose nudge to my hand. I was a fool to believe Vlad Zaleski was ever capable of being anyone other than who he's always been. A monster, a brother and a father, only driven to protect his family, not be a part of them as he should. A morally bankrupt businessman who has no cause or justification for doing the things he's done. Katrina's face holds in my memory. Her snide smile, her empty eyes, and her poisonous hands as they explored his body, as he allowed her to explore his body. Clara, the familiar voice outside my door, forces my eyes to close. The bed shakes as Meridius jumps down, running toward his master. When the door swings open, I open my eyes, take in a breath, and wait. Lying on my bed, my back is to V, and my eyes are trained on the wall. The size of his shadow in the hall light is remarkable. His body's outline moves as he settles his back against one side of the door jam. At the same time, he positions his hands to his hips. He lowers his head. Katrina is gone, he states quietly. I told her to leave. The empty anger I've been grasping onto in hopes of holding the source of true hurt at bay comes rushing to the surface. If it was me he was thinking about as he touched her, then she shouldn't have been here at all. Turning only my head, I take a startling look up. In the profile of the hall's light, V lifts his head, wearing an expression I've never seen from him before. Regret, maybe. Hurt? Katrina is gone? Angry, I still mock the question with a hiss. Well, thank you for telling me. Sitting up quickly and throwing my feet over the edge of the bed, I watch as V takes a step inside the room, then another, keeping his hands in his front pockets. Remembering I'm not completely sober, I place my hands on my hips and make an effort not to sway. Clara, he evenly addresses, stop acting as if what you saw tonight broke your heart. Broke my heart. I repeat his words to myself in disbelief. You could tempt the heart of a saint in that dress. I didn't deserve to see your hands on her just hours after they were on me. His hand comes to my face. Before he's able to touch me, I swiftly move out of reach. Your spirit is admirable, but it's also exhausting, he states, dropping his arm and keeping his eyes on me. What happened? I question, catching his wince. Tonight, V, you... What shouldn't have happened, he assures. You called me yours. And in ways, I meant it, he returns. But not wanting to hear any more of his regret, I look to the floor as my shoulders come forward. Go, I whisper. Clara, he calls from a distance. Look at me. I don't want to. My life would only hurt you, he promises. You deserve... Your life is mine, V. Tonight was an example of that. What you think you know, you don't, he argues. Because I'm young, you assume I'm ignorant? No, not because you're young, but because you're innocent. You deserve more. You're right, I agree. Stealing my spine... I come face to face with his selfish anguish. I deserve more, more than a man like you could ever give me. Watch what you say to me, he warns. It's the truth of what I'm saying, not my tone that pisses you off. Walking toward me in quick steps, 
V invades my space. He's been drinking. The smell of whiskey wafts from his mouth when his hand fists my hair, leaving his face only inches from mine. The truth, he repeats. Do you want the truth? You're hurting me, I quietly reply. Physically, V's not hurting me at all. Emotionally, in this moment, like those before, he holds the power to ruin all I ever believed he could be. Because of this, I insist. Let me go. At my words, whether the meaning behind them or the tone I've used, V's grip tightens. Without warning, his mouth crashes forcefully against mine. This kiss isn't gentle. It's not seductive in nature or carefully considered. He's showing me his anger, his frustration, his brutality. As I part my lips to scream in protest, V's tongue slides inside, dueling with mine for control. He releases my hair before cupping my face and holding my head steady as the punishing assault continues. My stomach churns while my desire for a man I once feared evolves into something else. Images of being taken by him, the way Katrina had been, batter my self-control. My hands position at his chest, then slide over his bare and broad shoulders. His skin is warm, inviting, but it's still not enough. I can't remember a time in my life that my senses have been this heightened. Sounds of flesh meshing together, breaths being taken between us, hands frustratingly exploring the other's body, all of it a confusing mix of something profound. Setting me free, Vlad bites my bottom lip before pushing me back. Nearly losing my already unstable balance, I cling to his arms to avoid falling. Without so much as a second glance back, Vlad turns, leaving me standing alone in the middle of my room. Before walking out, he grabs the door handle and turns back to me, his slow glance traveling from my head down my body. Even though I'm dressed, he's still able to expose me. But I'm doing the same. He can't hide behind his mask of indifference much longer. I won't let him. He kissed me. As if he hears my unsaid challenge, Vlad's eyes narrow into a malevolent scowl. Without another word, V takes his final step out, closing the door behind him. Happy birthday, my beautiful girl. 13. Clara Holding a familiar piece of silver jewelry in my hand, I look up to find the vendor watching me appreciate its beauty. We've been shopping outside all day, and I still haven't decided what to buy. You found the Gebrunga. Gleb points to what I'm holding as he smiles at my confusion. A what? I've seen this before. V's back is marked much the same. I've studied the emblem traced on his skin many times, closely with every opportunity I'm given. But I haven't seen one like this in a long time. Gleb muses. I don't... It's the symbol of a two-headed eagle. He explains, then adds... They're said to have immeasurable strength, enough power to carry the biggest prey in their clutches. Or carry those they love from harm's way? I argue. Gleb's dark eyes smile. His face, always gentle when addressing me, grows even more so. Sure, Clara, he answers, using the tip of his finger to poke my nose. Only you would turn such a powerful creature into a lovesick fool. I didn't do that. Laughing, he pokes again. You did. I said power. You said love. Can't they be considered the same? I ask. Gleb's head rears back as if I've struck him. Christ, how old are you? What do you know about love? Be nice, I insist. You know what I'm saying. Looking down, I study the silver pendant. The double-headed eagle's chest is broad, its eyes fierce, its talons sharp, its beak sharp. The expansion of its wings is colossal. I've never known its name. I wouldn't have forgotten its beauty. When Mug came to my room yesterday morning, she was frantic. Through the drama of packing my bags, she explained that both Benny and I were headed to wherever it was V was going. His name and thought alone made me angry. Still nursing my bruised ego in the face of Katrina and V, then my response to his punishing kiss, I wanted to deny her orders, but it would have been a wasted effort. 
Eight days have passed since my birthday, which was the last time I spoke to V directly. I've only seen him a few times, and when we've been in front of the others, no one has seemed to notice any difference between us. This attests to our turbulent relationship, if that's what I can call it. Within thirty minutes of barging through my door, Mock had me up from my bed, dressed, and holding a bag with all my necessities packed for the trip. The older woman can be incredibly pushy, but incredibly brilliant just the same. Once Fenny and I arrived at the extravagant hotel, we were seen to our rooms. In mine was where I found Ruan waiting for me. For the rest of the day I was left alone, except for Ruan who stood quietly at my door. I scanned the variety of magazines left out on the table, flipped through a few mindless television shows, and then ordered room service for late dinner before turning in early after a warm bath. Faina was supposed to meet us here this morning, but never did. I didn't ask Gleb why she decided not to come, assuming it was because, with all of us gone, she'd have time alone to enjoy the peace and quiet. Gleb confirmed exactly that. This morning, Gleb handed me an envelope full of money while explaining how I was taking Venny shopping to the street market vendors downtown. I was told to buy anything I wanted, for whomever I wanted. With V's schedule being as busy as it's planned to be, Gleb told me he and Ruan would stay with us. Abram and Leonid, along with a few others, would follow V. In the little time Gleb spent shopping with Benny and me, I've learned firsthand that he doesn't particularly care for crowds, or maybe he doesn't care for people in general. It's very pretty, I comment before losing Gleb's attention, and it makes a perfect gift for someone you admire. He notes, Faina, maybe? I hadn't thought of her. Faina is a woman. One of a kind, clothes and shoes would be more fitting. This particular pendant is masculine, and so my thoughts drift to V. The side to him, much like the eagle, is intense, powerful, and vast. The side I've seen frightening me as a girl, always present— the other side, though, still as visceral and strong, could be considered different. There's a delicate sensitivity to V I'm sure he'd deny. However, there are times his actions have spoken louder than his words. His protective nature for those he loves is constant. Bringing together his power with his love for those he holds close makes up who he is, who he's come to be to me. It's late and I'm hungry. When's dinner? Venny questions, coming to stand at my side. He looks to my fingers where I rub the silver eagle to shine. Sweet, what's that? As his grubby hand moves in close to grab it, I pull it from his reach. Thankfully, I'm quicker than he is. It's a gift, I casually explain. Venny's eyes narrow. For who? For me, I cover. That's weird, he objects. Really, no one buys themselves presents. Gleb, now fully focused on the argument ascending between us, breaks in. Enough, Benjamin. You have money. Go buy something for yourself. Venny frowns. Yeah, I did, but I don't have any left. What? Gleb's face grows pensive. What have you done? Venny's cheeks turn red as another frown forms, this one deeper. Looking up at me for the confidence he needs, he explains. I gave it to an old man with a dog. He was holding a bucket. It was empty. Immediately on alert, Gleb stands tall. His towering height scans above the crowd. But quickly, Venny adds, he didn't have any food or a place to stay, so I gave him the money Clara gave me from Dad. Oh, Venny. My eyes sting with tears. Venny may be only sixteen, but he's making decisions beyond his years. Hugging him tightly at my side, he hugs me back with embarrassment. That was... I lose my words as he looks at me with bright blue eyes and a shy smile. I'm so proud of you, I exclaim. Girls are weird, he tells Gleb, who laughs. During dinner, Venny sits to my left, Gleb next to him, and across from me. Venny's done all he can to keep the conversation steered away from the incident of losing his money earlier. He's gone on about his model car collection, his choice of new music, and how anxious he is for V to take him shooting again next weekend. 
The area surrounding us is dim. The small light in the center of our table isn't meant to be shiny but intimate. Now that we're in a quiet corner of an outside eatery, we're left in peace with each other. No one would know we're seated here unless they rounded the corner of the building. Gleb's been eyeing the pedestrians from a distance with quiet and eerily controlled focus. I've been with this family my entire life, learning from their actions. I know enough to recognize that Gleb is on alert. What do you think, Clara? I'll tell Dad you're coming with us to the cabin next time. Gleb glances to me, waiting for my expected answer. Dad's cabin is big enough for all of us. Mog, too. Venny insists. It has three bedrooms and a really big back deck. Dad's bedroom has a balcony. He could see the lakes from there. When I was a kid, he used to tell me if it was quiet, the water would talk to him. The cabin Venny is talking about sits deep in the hills near a protected wildlife conservation about three hours or so from our house. I've only heard Faina refer to it, usually when V's in a bad mood and she begs him to go to his cabin and relax. I've never been there as I've never been invited. Venny has on occasion, but not often. Don't push him, Ven, I insist. Gleb's eyes narrow at my ordered response. V's busy. Ask him, but don't press. When he finds time, he'll take you. Us, Venny bites. I'm tired of you never going anywhere with us. Who says I want to go? I dig. That's why Fain is not here. You boys are the reason we girls need a timeout. Right, he answers, giving me his beautiful smile that will assuredly win over the first girl he ever chooses to love. In a slowing second, Gleb's attention moves sharply beyond my right shoulder. Then he gasps and reaches for my arm. Before he's able to get any closer, the smell of a filthy hand wraps tightly around my neck as dirty fingers dig viciously into my jaw. The weight of a man I can't see crushes down, his voice hissing in my ear. Don't fucking move. Staying still, I watch in terrified silence as Gleb leans to his side, stretching an arm to grasp the back of Venny's chair. Venny's body jerks violently. The metal legs of his chair scrape against the concrete, and the table shakes as Gleb moves him another foot away from me. Venny's mouth is open, but he's too stunned to react. Let her go. Gleb rumbles low, eyes narrowed and jaw tight. When the man holding me to him doesn't do as ordered, Gleb slowly repeats, Let the girl go. Clara! Venny calls. When I look in his direction, his eyes move to Gleb's hand resting under the table. He's armed, I know this, but with the cool blade now pressing against my throat, I fear any movement made against the man will no doubt bait him to use it. Up! he commands, stretching my neck to the point of pain. The sharp edge of the knife digs into my skin as I stand. Please let me go, I whisper, but to no avail. He's not listening. You and I are going to take a walk, he explains to the table at the same time he takes a step back. My hands are shaking, and my eyes are full of tears as I go with him. Venny's eyes are now blazing in fury, his bottom lip caught between his teeth. His absolute anger at what's happening and his helplessness to stop it washes over every feature of his face. Do something, Venny snaps, turning his furious gaze toward Gleb. You won't get far, Gleb advises calmly. You won't make it ten feet from this table. I'll slice her from ear to neck then, the man's abhorrent voice hisses. Save you the trouble of coming for her. You're a dead man, Venny strikes. My father will kill you for this. Gleb's jaw glenches, his temples protruding to immeasurable degree. Venny's feet move beneath him before he makes a fleeting jump to stand. With a quick hand to Venny's shoulder, Gleb shoves him forcefully back into his seat. All this done without Gleb taking his eyes from where I'm being held. Venny, it's okay, I utter, my voice breaking in terror. I'm okay, I assure again as I feel more tears release. Oh yeah, pretty girl. The man soothes in my ear. Everything's gonna be just fine. Now say goodbye. What do you want with me? I croak. The man straightens and the knife digs deeper into my neck. Gleb stands from his seat, readying himself to move. Someone's been waiting a long time to meet you. The vile man hisses. He's growing impatient. I don't think we want to make him wait any longer.
There is no other man. She belongs to Vlad, Gleb states casually. If you hurt her, then he's right. You're as good as dead. Gleb pins me with a look I don't understand. He's relaxed, as though he's finished dinner and is bored while waiting for dessert. His expression is troubling. Then he winks. The stranger releases my jaw. The blade, still in his hand, slices the base of my neck up toward the edge of my ear. The sting is sharp, and I gasp when warm blood trickles from the open wound. Clara! Then he shouts. Acting quickly, Gleb reaches out to hold him in place. Once Venny stops his struggle, he stands with his mouth open and his body motionless. Get that piece of shit the fuck out of here, Gleb orders, pointing to whoever is behind me. Where to? Ruan's voice questions. Gleb holds Venny back as he thrashes wildly to get to me. Once Venny is calm, Gleb turns to him, holding his head in both hands as he whispers, Not yet, Ven, keep it together. Once Gleb releases Venny, he makes his way toward me. Thrashing and muffles continue behind me before I gather the courage to turn around. Once I do, I'm met with Ruan's angry and hooded eyes. Standing in front of Ruan with a gun trained to his temple is the man who spoke grotesquely in my ear. He's dirty, hair thin, face gaunt, not tall or short, small frame, and his eyes just as I imagined. Crazy. You don't know who you're dealing with, the grotesque man lectures, whispering only to me. Ruan doesn't miss the threat. His arm tightens around the man's neck before he growls. You don't know who you're dealing with. She's Vlad's. Ignoring their heated exchange, Gleb states, Have Stefan take him to the shed. No light, no food, no water. Tell him he's not to leave him until we get back. When Gleb reaches up toward my neck, tilting my head to the side to get a better look, I crumple, surrendering to heavy sobs of relief. The area around us spins. Using two fingers, Gleb motions toward Venny. Some help here, Ven? Then he moves to attention and rushes to me, wrapping his arms around my waist and holding me so tightly I nearly gasp. The ride home is quiet, other than Venny asking how I feel with every minute that passes. He wants to know if I'm in pain, if I'm still scared, and if I knew who that man was. I haven't stopped shaking. Gleb hasn't stopped clenching his jaw. And Ruan, driving us to the hotel continues looking to Venny and me, sitting closely together in the back seat of his car. Fuck, I thought he was going to kill you, Clara! Venny snaps as he holds me close. I thought he was going to take you with him! Jesus, Ven! Gleb admonishes. What's your language in front of Clara? Smiling at Gleb, stepping in only as a gentleman would, I reassure. Calm down, I'm fine. Well, you weren't fine, you were scared, Venny insists. Ruan looks again to the mirror. He now winks as Gleb did. I wasn't. I lie. Really, Venny, I'm okay. More than I can say for whoever sent the man to touch you. Gleb quietly utters to Ruan. More than I can say for his boss, his boss's boss, and whoever else Vlad can think to get a hold of. Dad won't like this. Venny assumes after hearing what they've said pulling away and scanning my face as tears still stain my cheeks, he tells me, He's going to lose it, Clara. When Dad gets mad, he... I'll be fine, so your dad will be fine. We'll get that cut looked at when we get back to the hotel, Gleb tells me from the front. Reaching up to where the blade nicked my skin, I find a clot of blood has already formed. I don't think enough damage has been done to warrant medical attention. Thank you. I tell them all, for helping me in taking care of Venny. It's our job, Clara, Gleb explains, to watch over you and him both. 14. Vlad Chiro has never threatened my family or my operation. Killian Dawson decrees. But then again, once he's finished with you... There's no telling who or what you'll come for next. And what will you do if Chiro makes his next move in your direction, I question. Relaxing, Killian sits back in his metal chair and deviously smiles. I'll call you, of course. My hunch regarding Killian Dawson was spot on. He's a much older, quiet man, 
I'd say somewhere in his early seventies. He leads his family in the life of crime, but doing so carefully as to not make any more enemies than necessary. His tongue is sharp, his words direct, and their meaning clear. Crossing Killian or any of his own wouldn't benefit his enemy. As for me, cultivating a relationship with the Irish leader will serve a volatile purpose. I hate to admit this, but it seems I've misjudged Chiro's determination, Killian confesses. I was sure after you wounded him all those years ago, he'd keep his place. Doesn't appear he got my message. No. He shakes his head and looks out to the dark street ahead. Chiro's impatience and temper have never led him to smart decisions. Personal or business. A man can't change who he is, I suppose. But he could learn from his mistakes as the rest of us do. He doesn't. No, I agree. Apparently he doesn't. And there's no one strong enough to police his actions either. With most of his blood family dead or gone, Chero has no one left to guide him like we do. As we continue sitting around the small round table outside a dirty bar located on the edge of town, Killian shares his family's history in great detail. According to him, his father was a criminally honest man who came from a wealthy family. He wanted the world for a son, and he provided as much guidance as he could before suffering from a fatal heart attack before Killian had turned forty. So far, Killian hasn't relented on his decision not to expand his business from gun sale and trade. And so far, the only dislike he's shown for me at all is that I sell flesh. His hate for Chiro's drug and loan sharking is much worse. I'll use this in my favor. Killian believes any person can make a conscious decision, as long as they're lucid and aware of the consequences of their actions. Drugs, he believes, lead a mind astray to do things they wouldn't normally choose to do. Thus, the reason he despises Chiro for doing what he does in producing and distributing a wide variety of drugs. A woman's body, Killian feels, is a decision she makes to sell. Even those women who consider themselves trapped in a life of prostitution, if they're clean, there's always a chance they'll survive it. It may mean they must rely on the men who sell them for protection, but there are always other choices to consider. Do you have a family? Killian queries with curiosity. A wife? Children? No wife, I reply. I have a son. He's sixteen and so far hasn't shown any interest in what I do. The time is coming for him to understand, I'm sure. But you never married, he notably observes. As distracting as they are, images of Clara's face enter my mind. The determined and tedious woman has been creative in finding new ways to avoid me since her birthday. She's been relentless in torture in the way she smiles at the other men, talks so sweetly to Veni, and flauntingly jokes with Abram. This morning, knowing where I was going and why, I woke with a powerful need to ensure she was safe, left untouched and close. I decided both she and Veni would be coming to the city with me under the impression I was taking time off. No, I've never been married. Nodding, Killian rests his elbows on the arms of his chair. His hands are steepled, his mouth touching the top of his fingers, his eyes appear reflective. He pauses before offering, My son is everything to my wife and me. With a knowing grin, he picks up the glass in front of him and peers over the rim before broaching the most sensitive subject. You already know that before he died, my youngest son Patrick was married to Chiro Pelesci's younger sister. I do know this, I admit. I heard you adored the young Pelesci woman. 
Setting the drink on the table, he holds it between his thumb and first finger before spinning it in a small circle. Then he smiles. Gina Pelleschi was a remarkable person. She was a lot like Chiro's wife, Sophie. I like her, too, but don't see her often. My son loved his wife dearly in spite of whose blood ran through her veins. I think I understand. I think you do, too, he knowingly returns. Clara's circumstance was much the same. Anzin Kosliev was her father, but the two were nothing alike. Even if Enzin had lived, I believe Clara carried enough of the woman her mother was at the time to have done as Gina Pileshi did. Escape. A person can't change where they came from, and it's no fault of their own where that might be. Killian sternly advises. Gina broke free of her Pileshi name the day she met my boy. If you ask me, I'd say she had been looking for a reason to leave the family her entire life. They were in love, I surmise. They were. My poor grandson is half Irish, half Italian. But Liam's more than only his heritage. He's part his mother, and part his father above all else. It's a shame he lost his parents so young. Nodding. Killian takes another drink, then states, I'm sure some would say it's fate. Even so, I miss them both. And Liam. You ever think to get him back from Chiro? No, he answers. I know he's well. He's always been cared for. Gina made Chiro promise, if anything ever happened to her, that he'd keep Liam away from harm. So far, as much as I'm told, He's living up to that promise. Liam's a grown man now, and he's happy. That's enough for me. And I hear he's going to be a doctor. He is, Gillian nods. And whether he knows it or not, I'm very proud. What about your other son, I prod? Curious more than anything, but still vetting the family as I had intended. My oldest Killian will follow me. He has a soft heart, like his mother, but we're working to change that. Like his mother, no. Killian is a soft man himself. I'm certain he's aware of this, too, but would never admit it. Pride and honor won't allow such a weakness to be seen by others, especially those who could be considered a threat. My wife, Erlina has been begging for us to move back to Ireland. Her mother is there, and she misses home. There's nothing left for me in Russia. I don't express this as I don't want to discuss it. Leaning down from behind me, Leonid voices tightly in my ear. North, two hundred yards, a black van. His chin lifts toward the same unmarked black van I had noticed parked there twenty minutes ago. I'm sending someone in for a closer look. Nodding my acknowledgement, my gaze meets Killian's to find the aging, broad, blond-haired man in a gray suit grinning. It's dark outside, but there's no way to miss the flash of his white teeth. He thinks this is funny. Maybe I've underestimated his easygoing disposition, as now I'm considering he may be crazy. We've been spotted. He assumes correctly. And we've been watched. Considering we're meeting on the edge of Chiro's ground, he most likely got word the moment I arrived. Agreeing, Killian states, I'm guessing that was exactly your intention. As we turn to watch one of my men step into the street, Killian's voice lowers, not with alarm, but mischief. Ever get the feeling you're the sitting duck? And the hunter is holding an atomic bomb? Yes, I confirm. And as foolish as Pileshi has proven himself to be, we should head out. We'll talk again soon, Vlad, Killian assures, at the same time he stands. Following his lead, I reach out across the table to shake his hand.
The vast array of stray bullets breaks our hold on each other. The shattering sounds of breaking glass, bullets clipping the metal tables, and terrified shrieks of innocent people surround us, piercing my ears. Vlad! Abram shouts, tackling me at the same time Killian's right-hand man takes him down. Killian and I both roll beneath the table as bullets continue to scream past. Bodies drop around us as quiet curses are heard near and in the distance. You've pissed him off, Killian voices loudly, covering his head but turning his focus to me. If we make it out of this alive, you're going to owe me a bottle of my favorite scotch. Fucking hell, Vlad, Abram hisses, pulling both guns from his holsters and handing one over to me. Stay here. As the stuttering sounds of the attack continue, I roll to my back and look up. The bar windows have all been shattered. People are fleeing in the crowd, emptying the bar amidst terrified screams. Agonizing groans of a man three feet in front of us call our attention. Killian's men are pulling him from harm's way. The black van starts to slowly pass. The door is open, revealing several men holding automatic weapons while wearing black masks. A choking gasp is heard from the street in front of us, where the man Leonid sent to check out the van is lying alone. His eyes are on me, blood oozing through his long fingers as he clutches his gushing throat. A man I don't recognize lies at his side. Half his face is gone. Another man I don't know is crawling toward us, his hand a mangled mess so he uses his elbows to gain distance from the street. Fuck me, Abram hisses. Vlad, are you shot? Turning my focus from the man who's no longer breathing or blinking, I look to Abram as the others around us begin to stand. Killian's eyes assess the men in the street before circling back to mine, no trace of worry or wear in their depths. Jokingly, he states, Mission accomplished, Vlad. You've poked the lion. And now he's broken free from his cage. Fuck, I'm hit, Abram interrupts on a hiss. As he rolls to his back, he keeps his hands clutched to his upper thigh. In the shadow of the streetlights, I note a shimmering pool of blood working its way from beneath him. Fuck, he hisses again. Damn it, if this doesn't kill me, Luciana will. Leonid, I bellow positioning to sit. Looking around, I don't find him, so I call again. Leonid! Where the fuck is that son of a bitch? Abram gasps in pain. The idiot is never around when I need him. Help is coming. Leonid steps out from the shadows. Walking closer with Killian's man at his side, he looks down to state, Killian's men are en route to help. Five minutes tops. Good thing I brought a small army here with me, Vlad. Killian chimes in, ever so calmly. To include a medical team fit for the president. Standing beside Leonid and looking down, he explains, I had a feeling we may need it. They'll see to your man here. Fucking hell, I've never been shot. Abram curses again, rolling to his side in obvious pain. If I knew how bad this was going to hurt, I wouldn't have taken the bullet for you. Shut up, Abram, I tell him, watching his face pale. Cry to me later. For now, save your energy. Luciana is really going to really kill me this time, he mumbles, then settles on his back. If I make it through this, Vlad, make sure she kills me quick. Killian's crew arrives, and the group of men begin to stumble out of the back of an SUV, even before it has a chance to slow. Slapping Abram on his opposite leg, I concur. She is going to kill you, friend. But if I don't do all I can to save you, she'll kill me too. And I don't think I'll care much for dying. Let's get the fuck out of here, Leonid urges, bending down to take Abram's hand. 
Sirens blaze in the distance as four men collectively lift and carry my best friend away in the darkness. 15. Clara Clara? A man's familiar voice calls. When I lift my head, Gleb is standing in the doorway of my room, looking as tired as I feel. Would you mind some company? Accepting my nod as invitation, he walks inside the room with cautious steps to come sit on the bed next to me. My hands are folded in my lap, still shaking in memory as I've been processing all that's happened. Hours earlier, after being escorted back to my room, I ran a hot shower and let the warm water wash over my dirty skin. The tainted filth around my jaw and neck from the man's fingers burned like fiery embers. His putrid smell still lingered in my hair. No amount of soap could wash either away. My body shook. Thoughts of what could have happened instead of what did held tightly, still holding me hostage like an invisible noose wrapped tightly around my neck. You're overthinking, Gleb quietly observes. You don't have anything to be afraid of, Clara. You're safe. Nodding with debatable agreement, another tear adding to the countless many before it tumbles down my cheek. I quickly move to swipe it away, but not before Gleb's hand catches my wrist. Using the backs of his finger, he clears my face of visible worry. Then, just as gently, he brings my hand to his lap and squeezes it in desperately needed comfort. I'm sorry for what happened to you, he says calmly. You've never been, this wasn't your fault. I return, and it wasn't Gleb's fault at all. I'm okay. You're not, and that's okay. But just know that there's nothing left to be afraid of. Isn't there? I question, unsure I'm ready to hear his answer. Not as long as Vled has anything to say about it. How is he? Gleb's eyebrows furrow. How's Vled? I haven't seen him since we got back, and... When he doesn't answer, I survey his pained expression. His dark hair is dirty, and his posture shows fear, if not defeat. I'd been so caught up in remembering what happened to me tonight that I hadn't given thought to how Vlad would react to his men being in harm's way right along with Venny and me. Vlad doesn't know what's happened yet. We tried to contact him, but he was unavailable. He's on his way back from the city now. Oh, I reply. I have a son about your age, Gleb states, changing the subject to my relief. He's several years older than I am. By appearance, I knew this. However, I hadn't realized how much older until now. Why is it that I've never met him? How old is he? Smiling, he says. He'll be twenty-four next month. I've kept him away from my life here for his own safety. He's still in school and is studying to be a pharmacist. You're a proud father, I observe, and am rewarded with a hearty smile. Absolutely. He's worked hard. His mother and I... You're married? No, he replies. She left when Micah was a toddler. It's been just him and me since. Heart heavy, I ask. You never remarried? No. This life isn't for everyone. It's not. Though I have no comparison, I'm not oblivious to the fact that neither Vlad nor Faina ever married. Mak is considered hired help, loyal as she may be, but she isn't married either. The recognition in this is startling. Surely Vlad will eventually have more in his life than what he has now. Even with how angry I am at him, the notion he may not strikes with sadness on his behalf. As Gleb and I sit together in stilted silence, my gaze turns to the open hotel room door. Images of the man who was taken away today for touching me fills the empty space. His voice whispers in my ear as if he were still holding my head against his chest. The fresh memory of the coolness of his blade sends a sobering wave down my spine. You're still overthinking, Gleb pushes, but doing it playfully. It won't do you any good, so you should stop. Who was that man? Shaking his head, he asks, I assume you don't know either? No, I don't. Vled has enemies, he cautiously supplies. 
but we don't know if you have them as well. How's that possible? I don't know anyone to have enemies. My hands start to shake again, wanting Gleb to take back what he's insinuating. I don't know anyone outside this family. Venny and Faina are my best friends. Mock is like an aunt to me. The men in the house have always served as protectors. Give us time and we'll find out who he is. And then? And then he'll be handled. Where did Ruan take him? Not answering, Gleb looks down. A part of me childishly believed that once we were safe in the car and headed back to the hotel, all of this would be over. I hadn't given consideration that anyone else, someone more dangerous, could have been behind it. However, living with V and his army of men, I should have been mindful to the possibility. Abram would tell you that God was with you today, Gleb explains, looking not at me but to the mirror on the wall ahead of us. I believe that too. You and Ruan were with us today. I return. You were so calm. All of the men are trained to stay calm. If there's anything we've learned from Vled, it's control. Studying my hands, I whisper, I don't understand any of this. Shaking his head, Gleb moves to stand. When he looks down, pitting his gaze to mine, he states, We don't know who or what that man was after, but... We will. Analyzing what may or may not have happened is a waste of your energy. You're telling me not to worry about something I can't forget. Vlad doesn't take well to his family being used against him in his business dealings. You're his family, Clara. Just the same as Faina, Veni, Mark, myself, or any of the others he cares about. I'm not one of the others, Gleb. I admit sadly. I'm only Clara. The amusement in his voice comes gently, but I hear it all the same. When he grabs my chin, tilting my head to his, he smiles. Whether Vlad believes this yet or not, you are so much more than only Clara. And because of that, we're all so thankful you're okay. 16. Vlad How is she? I question at the same time entering Clara's dim hotel room. Safe to assume, judging by his rigid posture and tense shoulders, Gleb was listening for my key to hit the door, thus immediately standing to attention. With the chair left as evidence behind him, I'm relieved to note he's done exactly as I ordered. After finding out what happened, Clara wasn't to be left alone until I could make my way back if only so I could see for myself that she was safe. Clara's large hotel suite is muted, void of the vibrancy I've recently come to recognize any time she's close. I scan the room to find the bedside lamp has been left on. She's in bed, positioned on her back, covers drawn up to her chest, and from where Gleb and I are standing it appears she's sleeping soundly. Her personal items are scattered throughout the room. A small black bag sits alone on top of the hotel dresser, some of her clothes spilling out the top. A brush, hand mirror, and a lip gloss lie forgotten at its side. A pale colored dress I saw her wearing this morning lies on the floor in front of the long standing mirror. The blood stains are minimal, but there. For the first time in all these years, living together but also apart, I discern with difficulty how it is I don't truly know anything about Clara. Nothing that matters, anyway. I know she can be quiet, timid, and often unsure of herself. Yet from experience I also know she's mostly this way only in my presence. I know she's also fiery, brave, and speaks with conviction when she deems something important and those she cares about have her utmost loyalty, trust, and love. I don't know the common and small trivial details of her life, what kind of books she likes to read, what type of music she listens to, where she'd like to vacation, who comforts her when she feels lost. Simple things I should know about someone I've kept in my home for so long, I don't. Forcefully taking my gaze from Clara, I pull my focus back to Gleb. 
His eyes are wide as he considers my blood-stained shirt and pants. Once the doctor, who Killian insisted would take care of Abram without causing an unwanted hospital scene, removed the bullet from Abram's thigh, I was adamant my advisor be brought back here. The wound hadn't been deemed life-threatening. Not a flesh wound, but one he'll recover from in time regardless. As I entered my hotel room, I caught Leonid and Ruan along with several others congregated in the corner. A few of the men were pacing, faces red and hands in their hair. The moment I said my first word, demanding every detail of what happened, all eyes came to mine. That was when Ruan explained. Images of Clara, cut and bleeding, pressed against my chest centering me with force and stealing my breath with every agonizing detail. Visions of my son, terrified and powerless to stop what he was witnessing, urged me on, pleading to find and punish all those responsible. Answers have yet to be found. No one person has been identified who could take responsibility for either the act of threatening Clara or attempting to take out Killian or myself. However. Identifying the one common threat takes not proof, but common sense. Chiro Pileshi thinks he's ready for me. Closing the distance between us, Gleb clears his throat before explaining, The wound to her neck was superficial. Doc said she didn't need stitches. The knife wasn't as sharp. Twisting in place as he describes the blade that was pointed at her neck, I grab Gleb by the collar and drag him to the farthest wall away from Clara. When his body slams against it, he makes no move to fight back. He'd lose if he tried to get away, not by the power of my position, but by the anger of my fists. You should have been watching them, I quietly hiss. This is on you and Ruan. You failed my son and Clara tonight. Venny had been asleep when I walked into our room. His cheeks were stained with tears. Even being sixteen, nearly a man, I wouldn't chastise him for showing emotion with threats made against his precious Clara. He loves her as his own sister. I know this, and I won't use her love to serve him a lesson. Had this happened a few years ahead, then yes, but not now. This is the first time Vinia Min has been exposed to the ways of the world as I live it. He'll heal, but it'll take time and convincing. Yes, we failed them, Gleb states. But it was I who missed the man, not Ruan. The unrestrained remorse in Gleb's eyes reflects his apologies, but his regret means nothing. There isn't an apology worthy of Clara's forgiveness. The lives of a woman and a child, set out to experience things they never have, were changed. No empty sentiments will ever take that fear away. No shallow promises that it won't happen again will ever make them feel as secure as they did just yesterday. Releasing Gleb, I take a step back. Nodding, he straightens his shirt before he assures, As I said, Clara will be okay. She won't. Not at all. The cut to Clara's skin may be nothing. The cut to her sense of safety will run deeper and longer than either of us can imagine. I'll stay with her until Ruan gets back, he insists. She didn't want to be left alone, and he's in town. Leave us. I dismiss. Ruan, out of all my men, sure as fuck won't be staying anywhere tonight but in his own bed alone. We'll finish this in the morning. She's strong, he whispers, lifting his chin to the bed. She's strong even believing you don't think of her as your family. His subtle accusation runs its course, guiding my fury to another place. Clara has every reason to doubt my loyalty to her. I've not treated her as an equal among my family. 
and by all right, as my sister has claimed for years, she is part of us. Furthermore, she's becoming a part of me. Clara's been mine since the day I gave her no choice but to be, and proving her worth without promises or expectations of her future. She accepted my decision to take her away from the life she could have had to the one I forced her into. If there's nothing else, Glib, I clip, turning my attention to the open door. Go check on Abram. He's in pain and miserable. He'll need help tonight. Silently, he turns away. Before he gets to the door, I call again for his attention. At the same time our eyes meet, I extend a nod. Of course I'm enraged he or any of my men didn't protect Clara as I would have. By missing a mark who most likely would have taken her away, used her body, tortured her soul, and then left her for dead, they risked me losing her completely. But luckily as it stands, because of him and Ruan, the predator didn't get the chance. Once the door is closed, I reach for the closest chair and position it beside the bed. Standing above Clara, I contemplate what I'd say to her if she were listening. The faint mist of her breath as she cared for my hand in the kitchen covers my lips. Her angelic voice, giving me her promise, echoes in my ear. No, V. I've never been touched by anyone. The healing cuts to the inside of my hand burn. They ache as a reminder. Faina told me I needed to look after you. Clara's arms are relaxed, lying on either side of her head. Her hands rest palms up and open. My finger itches to trace their centers if only to gauge her response to my touch. My body is growing tired of warring within itself to deny the woman Clara now is. I didn't deserve to see your hands on her just hours after they were on me. Puzzled, I weakly admit, Abram was right. I don't know what in the world to make of you. Sitting down, I run my hands against my thighs to keep them distracted. My body tenses when she moves. Glancing up, Clara's eyes are open, meeting mine in sleepy shock. The green in them is shaded, broken, but aware. V? she utters. Yes, I answer, my voice raspy. Using her hands as leverage, Clara braces them beneath her to sit up. The white bedsheet drops, leaving her shadowed body in full view beneath the thin material of her nightgown. Her chest rises and falls faster as she starts to shake off sleep. Your clothes, she notices in a panic. My God, is that blood? She gasps next, sitting up and swinging her body from the bed. Her legs tangle with mine but in her panic she pays no attention, jumping to stand. Whose blood is that? Clara calmed down, I assert, looking up and lifting my hand in a placating gesture. With her in such a state of shock, as well as being driven by the force of her chest colliding with mine, my body is thrown back against the chair. Surprising me further, Clara bends at the waist and wraps her arms firmly around my shoulders. If I pulled her closer, she'd no doubt to drop to my lap. That man was so close. He was so close to Venny. Her sob breaks against my throat. Venny didn't know what to do. Clara, I soothed, not wanting to recognize the calm, coaxing voice as my own. Holding her head to my chest, I run my fingers through her thick, silky hair. Finding the bandage taped to her neck, I caress it as well, and thank Abram's God she wasn't hurt any worse than she is. In response to my comfort, a feral and savage gust of anguish frees itself from her chest. 
Her body shakes and violently hiccups before she surrenders, falling into me completely. My lips at her temple act as a bomb, somewhat allowing her to settle in my arms. Once she's collected herself, I don't look at her to question, are you better? I can't see her face, but she nods and inhales another painstaking breath. Pulling my head back, my chin dips to survey her. Her eyes are closed, her eyelids are swollen and red, and her cheeks are flushed. Other than when I took her away from the shed so long ago, kicking and screaming as she fought to free herself, I don't remember ever seeing her cry emotionally. Curling into me, Clara drapes her legs across my thighs. Instinctively, I wrap my hand around them, catching both her knees at once to pull her closer. Whose blood is this? she asks again, fingering the collar of my once-pressed white dress shirt. My eyes close, accepting the warmth of her breath against my skin. My cock pulses, not caring if she feels my reaction to her or not. My hand at her waist moves to run slowly up her back. The soft material of her gown beneath my palm weakens my resolve. I answer, but do it carefully. Abram was hurt tonight. He'll be back to himself in a few days. Her body jerks from my hold, tearing away our physical connection. She braces her hands against my chest and pushes with urgency to escape my lap. I watch as she stands and moves back to the bed. The loss after having her so close is overwhelming and unwelcome. All of this is Abram's blood? Her eyes scan my shirt, invisibly touching every inch. How? That's not important, I reply. Not important? How was Abram hurt? She clips with insistence. I want to know. Clara, I said no. Whether she's furious with me or the collective situation, I can't say. But when she stands, I follow. Again, Clara pushes against my chest, wordlessly demanding me to move. Her efforts are futile. I'm much taller, stronger, and more agile than she is. When she attempts to sidestep the wall of my chest in order to get away, I grab her arm. Where do you think you're going? Frantically, realization dawns in her eyes. Looking behind her, understanding she's trapped between my body and the bed, Clara abruptly jolts. Moving quickly, she pulls her arm from my grasp and attempts another escape. She stopped again when I drape my arm around her waist. Her body doubles over in protest before I am able to control her, pulling her back against my chest. With one arm at her waist, I cross the other over her chest, pinning her against me. The soft curves of her body submit as the fight in her spirit dims. V, she breathes. Dropping my head and finding purchase in her neck, I inhale a deep breath of all that's her. The familiar scent of lilacs blankets all sense and reasoning. It surrounds me in the cloud of doubt, enveloping my body in a torturous, wordless whisper. With each passing second, Clara succumbs to her own surrender. Clara, let me go to Abram. I insist. You can go see he's okay for yourself, V answers, releasing his hold at my waist, but you'll do it later. The arm draped across my chest stays in place as his other hand slowly slides up to rest at the base of my breast, where his thumb caresses gently. I freeze, not scared, but anxious. It's not until V's warm tongue tastes the sensitive skin behind my ear that I shudder. Sensing my reaction, V sets me free. With his heat at my back gone, the restraints he had on me vanished, I take a step forward to turn in place. I watch as he folds his large body and positions himself in the chair near the bed. Pinning me with an irritated glare, he cocks his eyebrow. With his typically hardened expression in place, he tersely questions, Are you settled? 
You won't run from me again? Clearly, in my attempt to escape, I foolishly lost the gentleness I found in his quiet strength. I want it back. I also want more. Giving me a glimpse of the man I knew was there, and then taking it away is unfair. Justly so, I'm disappointed in myself. I shouldn't have tried to get away. I wasn't running from you, I faintly promise, hearing the petulance in my tone. Not exactly. You were he states, extending his arm and aiming it in my direction. V nods to the cuff of his dress shirt. Get me out of this. My fingers work swiftly, lifting the blood-crusted sleeve from his wrist before sliding my thumb between his warm skin and the button. Once I have the first unclasped, I raise my other hand toward him, signaling to give me his other wrist. The tension Vlad exuded moments before has subsided, for now. As I'm coming to learn, balancing his volatile disposition must be done with care. Without asking permission, I reach for the first button of his shirt. When he drops his chin to watch my fingers, I hesitate until he sits back in the chair. Seconds pass before he nods for me to continue. My heartbeat quickens when my fingers brush the bare skin of his chest. My thighs quiver as I travel down, button by button, only to fumble near the zipper at his waist. Closing his eyes, a low growl emits from the back of his throat. I hesitate again. Then his large, powerful hands cover my own, lifting them to each side of his open shirt. Touch me, he demands, his voice full of resounding restraint. V, I return softly, closing my eyes and parting my lips to breathe. Grasping one wrist tightly, Vlad positions my hand to his chest. His other spreads my fingers, laying my palm flat against it. His jaw tightens. The corners of his eyes wrinkle as they narrow. Don't say my name like that again, he states. Panicked, my breath hitches and I take my hand away. My eyes widen and my stomach warms when my body gives way to its flutters of excitement. Touch me, Clara, he demands again. I want your hands on me. Seizing the chance, I revel in the strong contours of his chest and the muscles that lie beneath them. His skin is warm, his chest hair is light in color. Finally, after all the time I've spent admiring his definitive chest, I'm able to explore it. I do so slowly and carefully to avoid his interruption. Christ he hisses through a still tight jaw. When I look down, focusing on the bulge in his pants, another growl breaks from his throat, this one more vicious and authoritative. Casting a glance up, I find his eyes are trained on my face, studying my reaction to what I've seen. Bravely testing his resolve, I use only a single finger to explore the thick cords of his neck and throat. The abrasive stubble of his jaw pricks my skin. I take in a breath before dropping my finger and attentively rolling it over his collarbone. As the whisper of my touch trails back to the center of his chest, I exhale before stopping at his stomach. His muscles contract and I pull away. Clara, he calls, his voice ominous. These eyes are heated, boring into mine with challenge. No longer lost within this moment, I understand V has yielded his power over to me, offering me a control that I've never held over another person, especially him. Being able to coax a reaction from someone as bold and strong as he is with just my fingertips is intoxicating. Why are you trembling? He bids, his tone laced with disappointment as his finger lightly traces my jaw. Your hands are on me. Beautiful girl, I haven't touched you yet. Sensing my reluctance, V pushes. Are you scared? No, I lie. I hadn't realized I was shaking. I am scared, frightened at how being so close to him shadows my sense of reason, placing me on the edge of vulnerable but sure, cared for but defenseless, awake, but in a trance, alive. 
For the first time in my life, I'm alive and present under the intensity of a man's attention. V's attention. When my mouth opens, but I say nothing, he presses. Clara, are you afraid of me? Admitting fear in the face of a man who truly holds so much power is a risk. I've lived with him. I grew up watching those around him cower to his every word, his every order. Grabbing my wrists and shaking them roughly, V leans forward. Answer me. I'm terrified. Before I can explain, give my reasons for being afraid, V lunges forward. His hands force themselves beneath my arms, and I'm lifted into the air without resistance. As he brings me to my feet, he uses his body's deeply seated but controlled strength to force my back to the center of the bed. His body blankets mine, and his mouth comes to rest against my lips. Though the initial kiss is soft, I still tremble as his tongue sweeps against mine once before taking it away. This happens again and again. My breath is being taken, stolen, as V drinks from me. Then, something beautiful happens. A calm and quiet haze at the image of us together takes over, baiting my submission, preparing me to follow where he leads. And I go. Quietly. Willingly. I'm permissively walking into the demon's den, reaching for his hand and begging without shame for him to keep hold of mine with every step. As the kiss becomes more urgent, more aggressive, V forcefully grasps my upper thigh. My gown is lifted, leaving his fingers to go in search for what's beneath. With a small tug to my hair, my head tilts and he moves in. His teeth scrape my neck as his hips thrust hard between my legs again and again. Pleasure and pain ignite with both an aching and soothing vengeance. I feel him. When I gasp, aware of his rigid cock, so ready, V abruptly breaks free of his attention to my mouth. In short seconds, measuring only a few heartbeats long, all becomes lost. The kindness in his eyes, the softness of every feature— all of it erased as though nothing that happened ever existed. Watching me from above, V grasps my hips. A sharp snap burns my skin when he removes the barrier of my panties between us, exposing all of me to him. His eyes are dark as they come to mine. Slivered strands of fear, hope, and trust swirl in my mind as he pushes my thighs farther apart, positioning his calloused hand between them. When one finger pushes inside, I gasp. I'm only granted a moment to adjust to its intrusion before another is added, and together they start to move, in and out, slow and steady, again and again. His thumb flattens against my sensitive clit, my hips rolling in response. Taking over is a new calming confusion. I'm lost somewhere between begging for escape and pleading for more. Don't move, he whispers, again testing his teeth on the skin of my neck. Wait, I insist, exhaling relief as he stills. Just wait. Allowing my body to relax, V's chest moves up and down as fast as my own. My hands move to his shoulders, where I grasp them tightly, anchoring myself to him for balance. As I wrap my legs around his powerful frame, he pushes deeper inside. The space left between us is no longer considered or cautious. V's voice, still coarse and instructing, demands, When I let you come, you'll say my name. V! I gasp as his fevered motion in reaction to his name intensifies. He's concentrating on a place only I've ever touched. Farther and farther, my back inches up the bed as I pulse around him. Raising my arms above my head, I brace my hands against the wooden headboard. My eyes roll back when his head dips, savagely taking my sensitive nipple into his mouth. V, I don't... I don't know. Then it happens. The room spins... V's breath mixes with mine, and his tongue swipes my bottom lip. The gesture exudes a familiar intimacy, as though all of this was naturally born between us. 
when he grips the back of my thigh, wrapping my leg around his waist as his rigid cock lies against it, my skin inflames at the touch. V's growl reverberates against my chest, and he leans his forehead against mine. Come for me, my beautiful girl. My beautiful girl. Spurred by his possessive declaration, I do. I come fast and hard as my hips move and my feet burrow into the bed. No longer fearing one moment to the next, I give in to what he's done. It's exhilaration. It's intoxication. It's beauty. In return for letting him take a piece of me no one else has ever had, I get back what I hadn't even considered. V's regret. His face contorts into what looks to be both sorrow and anger. He doesn't chance a look at me as he removes his hands from between us. When he stands, V clears his throat before turning around and whispering, This was a mistake. A mistake? Heartbreak and accusations sink my chest, swallowing every shred of satisfaction I felt moments before. Doubt plagues, fear engulfs, if a human heart could be heard mid-break, the sound of mine could shatter windows. You care about me, I accuse, sitting up to watch V turn in place and run his hand through his hair. When his eyes capture mine in the dresser mirror, across the room, I find the empty depth of his repentance, but also something else. Truth. Finally turning back to me, V takes a single step forward but no more. His eyes peruse my body as I sit on the edge of the bed, waiting for any other reaction. When nothing comes, my eyebrows rise, urging him into saying something, anything, that would give his denial fair reason. Looking down, he grips the back of his neck tightly, the muscles in his shoulders tense as he states, You're asking me to give you something I've never given a woman before, Clara. You've had many women, V. Shaking his head, angering more with each passing second, he clips. Surely you're not asking only that of me. No, I've never hurt you, Clara, but this... He pauses and points behind me. If I let this happen, have you ever cared about a woman, V? I evenly question, ignoring his ridiculous notion. Yes, I... A woman... Someone other than Faina or Mock, I push. He doesn't respond, other than to release his neck and tilt his head to the side in thought. Maybe if you'd consider the possibility that you're able to be cared for, then you'd also consider what the woman you allowed to do it would look like. Clara, he whispers with hesitation. Seizing what may be my only chance to get through to him, I press forward, and maybe you'd consider me. That I already know what your life is about, what it means to be part of this family. I've looked up to you for as long as I can remember. Perhaps you shouldn't have, he clips. Perhaps there's another man for me. I fill in. We're here again. You won't be happy until I, what, find someone who isn't you? Yes, he answers clearly and without any hesitation. I return a lie just as good as the one he gave me. That's easy enough, then, I suppose. V's eyes narrow, and his lips draw tight. You should go, I state plainly. Go back to whoever it is who's made you so blind to what you should have but won't give yourself. I'm done. 17. Chiro Sitting in a dark corner of a crowded Italian restaurant, Chiro looks into the eyes of the beautiful woman in front of him and wonders how it is that his luck has so quickly changed. First, Osef has come to him, of all people, to seek help in getting Clara Kosliev away from Vlad. Adding to that gift, here sits another who wants just the same. How ironic. Tell me why I have reason to trust you. Chiro states pointedly, surveying any hesitations Katrina Marks may reveal. How do I know you haven't been sent from Vlad himself to find out if I'm working with Osef? Her eyes narrow before she bites out, I don't care if you believe me or not. You don't have to trust me to ruin him. 
You are in love with the Russian, are you not? Why would you want to see him ruined? I'm not in love with him. She remedies through a tight jaw, her cold, dark eyes glazing over to Chiro's satisfaction. Not anymore. Chiro considers all Katrina has already explained. She went into detail regarding Vlad's newly born interest in Clara, the young girl he and his sister had a hand in raising, before going on to say that the adored by the family, Faina Zaleski, has hated Katrina's existence inside the stable at Rachershi for as long as she's been there. Katrina made it clear that she wants to be part of any plan to undo the Russian organization in its entirety and to include his sister, Faina. She hasn't asked for a share of profit, a piece of the territory for herself, or credit for the role she'll play. She only wants revenge. What is it? she clips. What am I not making clear enough for you? Chiro rests his elbows on the table, holding a cigar in one hand and a picture of Clara given to him by Osef in the other. He's been carrying it around like an unsigned agreement, a trophy he's happy to shelve. If I decide you have a place here, and you betray me, it'll be the last move you'll ever make while breathing. Her sardonic laugh erupts. Betray you? You're one to talk. You shot up your own family. Lifting his eyebrows, Chiro wordlessly insists she continue making her point. Katrina leans forward in her chair, placing both hands on the table. Her blood-red nails match her dress to exact shade. Her lipstick is lighter but just as devilish. Chiro contemplates walking away, internally debating if this untamed tigress could ever be trained to do a job as he'd need it done. Your name was all over that shooting at Temple Square. You sent armed men to not only gun down Killian Dawson, your own family, but Vlad as well. I did, he admits. You failed. Chiro tisks. If I wanted either of those men dead, they'd be dead. Rest assured of that. You're playing with your food. Before I devour it, yes. Then why not let me help you catch the main course? Standing, Katrina smiles. You have my number. When you're ready to take back all Vlad took from you, let me know. With the parting words spoken, Katrina turns on her high heels and marches toward the door. As Chiro admires her body from afar, he revels in knowing that he's no longer alone in his plot to take what should have always been his. He's also elated to know that love, not greed, will be what finally brings Vlad to his knees. Losing that love will cripple the heart of the Russian. With any luck, Vlad will be without Clara as well as Faina soon. 18. Two weeks later. Vlad. It's time we had our talk, Vlad, my father announces, pointing to the empty chair next to his. Sit. As he holds the glass tumbler of scotch in one hand, the other casually rests on the arm of the leather chair. How are things? He queries to start. After hearing all about what's happened, my father's less-than-enthusiastic arrival didn't come as a surprise. I knew he'd have something to say, and since he got here four days ago, he's hardly said anything at all. Grabbing the liquor bottle at his feet, I pick it up in an effort to measure how this conversation will proceed. Finding only a small amount of the contents gone, I sit back next to him and brace. Talks with Vori have always been tried and tested in accordance to how much alcohol he's consumed. Tonight, for obvious reasons, I already know why he's choosing sobriety over indulgence. He's angry with me, and doesn't want to risk my missing his point. Nothing has changed, I return, delving straight to the heart of his concern. 
We're no closer to finding proof it's only Clara who Chiro is after. If he's after her at all, we still don't know it's him. You question the man you had Stefan holding? Yes, I answer, supplying him with what he already knows. He said nothing, staying loyal to whoever sent him. Until his last breath, my father assumes correctly. By the time I made it back from the city, the man Stefan brought back was dead. I trusted my men to do all that was necessary to extract the information needed. Unfortunately, there are those men who refuse to bend, even when copious amounts of pain are inflicted. It's possible the man had no idea who exactly he was working for. Considering how severely he'd been worked over, I'd venture to guess he was nothing more than a hired hitman. We're looking into more leads now. You won't find anything. Vori cautiously returns, then flips his tone to extend an insult. Right now, you're being outsmarted. Chiro and his men are laughing at you. He's baiting me, I remind. That isn't smart. It's stupid. If I have proof he stepped foot into my operations, he'll answer for it. Tilting his head, aiming his eyes to mine, my father hesitates before abrasively asking, And you'd consider going head-to-head -head with Polishi all over the girl? The girl? Fuck. Since the night at the hotel, feeling her body under mine, both trembling in fear but also thriving at my touch, I haven't considered her a girl at all. It's probable I stopped considering her to be anything other than my own personal temptress long before then. That night I stayed in her room much longer than I had planned. The steady breath she took against my skin coerced me to keep her close, safe, protected. All my energy had been used to keep her at whatever distance I could, but my body ached to truly touch her, so I did. However, I've managed to avoid Clara completely since we've been back. I've told myself my focus must adhere to business, to Abram's care, my soldier's widowed family, and the Chiro Peleshi, the man my gut is telling me without any doubt is responsible for all of this. Faina loves Clara, as does Vanny, I explain. Like it or not, the girl is part of this family, Vori. Her last name is Kosliev, not Zaleski. Maybe you've forgotten. He penalizes over the rim of his glass. Turning his gaze to the fireplace burning in front of us, he adds, And Clara isn't yours to decide what to do with. At his assertion, I flinch. My hands ball to fists with unreasoned anger. Clara isn't mine entirely, yet she belongs to me in the ways even Vori himself should understand. Guilt wades in with each carnal thought she's enticed within me, making it impossible for me to hold her at bay. Clara's touch wields too much power, and it's a power I can't afford to give her right now, if ever. Your mother sends her love. My father expresses with sincerity, briefly changing the subject. She wanted to come this visit, but with so much chaos surrounding you, I told her she had to stay back. She's always been welcome in my home, I counter. Any time. Turning to me, Vori's eyes narrow. Welcome, yes. Safe, no. You have no idea when or where Chiro will strike. I imagine he's been picking at his wounds since you destroyed all he had years ago. He's never made a move against me, I insist. Smiling coolly, Vori reminds, Hasn't he? I saw the pictures, Vlad. Ruan was beside himself when I ordered them brought to me. Chiro sending one of his men to test the boundaries of your patience is in fact a move against you. A threat. Surely you know this, 
or have you learned nothing since being on your own? He's right about Chiro, but rather than give him more reasons to doubt my resolve, I advise I'll handle Pileshi. You won't, he snaps, lowering the glass to his lap and tracing the edge of it with his finger. I already have. Right now, there's a group of your men scouring the city. Every Pileshi contact to find out who's been snooping where they shouldn't. Vehemently, I question who gave that order. I did. However, it should have been given by you. You had no right to interfere, I clip. You're putting my men, our family, in danger. I did. He returns. My eyes are opening, Vlad. You treat your men like equals. They're not. Aside from Abram, who even I consider family. You allow them to come and go as they please. In part, he's correct. However, growing up in my father's home, I witnessed firsthand the distaste his men have for him. I knew then that given an opportunity to run things as I wanted, I would change how they'd always been run before. And so far, it's worked. We may not agree in how business is run, Vori, but the operation is all the same. You've lost sight of so much. He returns with regret. I haven't. Disregarding my denial, Vori continues in assumed triumph. By the time your men have finished proving my point that it is indeed him, Chiro will have no choice but to knock harder on this door to challenge you. My blood boils, my body seethes. Once again my father is prodding and pushing where he shouldn't. The trust he claims to have in my abilities is once again tarnished. Don't be angry. This is business. Business, I grind out. Clara hasn't ever been one of us. She's dispensable. If Chiro wants her, he can have her if it means he slinks quietly back to the hole he came from. The night was intended to remind him of your power. He shot at you, Vlad. He killed one of your men. He must answer for it. He also shot at Killian Dawson and killed two of his men. Killian could have been the target, not me. Killian Dawson has no real and true enemies. He keeps his operation tight, you know that. Instinct tells me my father is right. Killian Dawson has a level head. He's aging. Technically, though the two men do not speak, Chiro and Killian are family. Whoever attacked with guns blazing was there for me. And thank Abram's God, their aim was shit. Faina will be coming home to Russia at the end of next week, Father states. I don't know how long she'll be away from you, Vlad. But until things here settle, I don't want your sister to hinder your judgment and handling business as it should be done. She won't willingly go home with you. I insist. She's happy with her life here. She doesn't get to decide. If there's anyone I blame for your lack of urgency, it's your sister. You spoil her, and in turn she sullies your resolve to handle things as you should. She doesn't, I deny. No, he snaps, twisting his neck and aiming his angry glare at me. What happened when she first came to you? There's no need to discuss. I know what happened. Faina created the very reason my father continues to doubt my leadership. She left, Vlad. For almost a year, you had no idea where your sister, your responsibility, was. Faina was adjusting. Faina was resisting. I'm sorry for her being a woman. I'm sorry she has to endure living a life she hates. But we all make sacrifices, don't we? Agreeing, if only to avoid discussing my sister's ever-challenging ways, I nod. Faina has so much of your mother in her. She continues to live with her head in the clouds, pleading ignorance to all we do. Does she know about any of this? 
Shaking his head, he replies, No, and I'd tell her if she were here. But of course, Vaina has disappeared again. Weaving is her way of throwing a tantrum. I'm too old to deal with tantrums. Because she's my sister, I defend. Any time she needs a break, I encourage her to take one. She spends most of her time caring for Veni and helping Mock, or busy doing charity work. She has no job, no husband, no life, nothing to warrant running away. Veni will have a hard time without her, I assert. He loves her. Veni needs to start learning what his role in this family means, he replies with confidence. He's your son, Vled. Yet the boy is still clueless about what it means to be your son. Veni is young. Veni doesn't get to stay young for much longer. I'll go easy for a while. I won't push. Believe it or not, Faina leaving will force him to grow as a person. Give the boy a break, Vori. He's a good kid with a good head on his shoulders. If anyone needs a break, Vled, it's you. He tells me. What? You're going away for a few days. You'll stay at your cabin. Needless to say, when Faina hears of my decision to take her with me to Russia, 